moment of silence. Any board member like to dedicate today's moment of silence? Supervisor McPherson. You know, I don't think we can go without uh, thinking about the people in Tallahassee right now. What, what happened down there? The young kids and um, teachers. Uh, it just isn't right. We all know that. Uh, we don't know why, but um, we just pray for their healing as best they can. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Do a moment of silence, please. Please join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Friend, members of the board, there's one change on the consent agenda. Item number 40, additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 341, replaced. Um, page, paragraph 14 should read, Mental Health Advisory Board, Antonio Rivas. Uh, that concludes the revisions and corrections to the agenda. Thank you. Are there any items from board, uh, are there any items that board members would like to move from the consent to the regular agenda today? Okay, seeing none, uh, we're going to open it up for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda or within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, or if you'd like to make a comment on the consent or regular agendas if you can't stay. I also understand that uh, Supervisor McPherson has a public, a brief public comment he would like to make on an item that is not on today's agenda. Let me do Please. that now. Yeah. yeah, I have the, actually there's two comments I'd like to make. Uh, one has to do with Central Coast Community Energy. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, the new uh, CEO of Triple CE, as we're called, uh, Rob Shaw and Catherine Steadman and I went down to San Luis Obispo to have an item for the unincorporated area of San Luis Obispo County to join the Triple CE network. Um, we got that on the agenda. And then last week, um, we we got a positive vote for the unincorporated area of San Luis Obispo to join Triple CE. That um, makes 35 governing agencies from Santa Cruz to Santa Barbara County uh, included in this, uh, this effort. Uh, it's a tremendous um, effort that began here in Santa Cruz County. And uh, can't thank it enough our, our CEO, Carlos Palacios, our legal team that we have, uh, including Dana McRae back when, when we started this. Uh, it's been a 10-year effort, and uh, we have really the Central Coast region. It's terrific. Um, our, reach, our goal of reaching 60% renewables by 2025 and 100% renewables by 2030 is on track. We're way ahead of the state goal of 2045. So um, I just want to thank the Triple CE team, the Santa Cruz County, for getting us in this position to um, really address uh, some of the really serious uh, environmental issues that we have here. Uh, it's a tremendous organization, and it's been a great a privilege to work with them. Uh, secondly, uh, I was on a conference call with the uh, California State Association of Counties, and they were discussing uh, a very comprehensive plan of statewide uh, to address statewide homelessness. Uh, we are the counties, the 58 counties of Santa Cruz are joining the 480 plus cities in uh, the state to address this and do it with uh, uh, availability of funds, funding and cooperative effort and uh, and really to get some accountability in this. Uh, we need to address this in a statewide manner. And uh, we will have a, a better outline of the package. It's called at home of how we're going to address this in a statewide manner with the governor's office, all the cities and all the counties. Uh, it's going to be a tremendous effort and we're going to probably have a better idea of the outline of how we are going to go uh, from the start in about two weeks or so. So I just wanted to mention that. And I wanted to also mention that uh, Chair uh, Zach Friend has been a very, very strong advocate uh, in the health and human services area of CSAC as well. And uh, we've all pitched in to see how we can address this. It's a, a statewide problem for sure. And uh, we want to just try to resolve it as quickly as we can. Thank you. 
Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'd like to open it up for public comment. Good morning and welcome. Welcome back. <laughs> Good morning and thank you for your services, Supervisor. Uh, Supervisor, so my name is Shalak Avanis. I live and love Santa Cruz. I also have the privilege of serving on the Mental Health Advisory Board. I'm joined here today with Serge, the co-chair for the Mental Health Advisory Board, and Julie, the executive director of the Walnut Family and Women's Center. We'll be reading a letter which you will find in your packet under written correspondence under letter T, and I'd like to give the rest of my time to Serge. Good morning. <clears throat> the Mental Health Advisory Board recommends that the Board of Supervisors does all in its power to ensure safety and dignity in all shelter services contracted with and or cited in the county and institute safeguards to address incidents which occur. On the night of Wednesday, March 1st, the county contracted to provide a warming shelter to ensure the safety of our people experiencing homelessness. An agreement was made with the Santa Cruz Veterans Memorial Building at 846 Front Street for the building's use. On Thursday, March 2nd, just after 10 a.m. a member of the mental health advisory board while walking past the building's parking lot witnessed Dave Pedley assistant building manager of the Santa Cruz veteran memorial building violently and repeatedly attack a client of the shelter at, a, at approximately six foot three inches tall Mr. Pedley towered over the female client who was approximately five foot five he repeatedly shoved her while cursing and telling her she was trespassing a board member shouted for the attack to stop and was threatened by Mr. Pedley the client reported that she had been told that she could use the porta potties but had found them locked and was forced to urinate behind them the attack was captured on building cameras the board member assisted the client in calling 911 Santa Cruz police arrived but as often happens, a complaint was not filed. The Mental Health Advisory Board asked the Board of Supervisors to one, affirm the following for all providers of shelter services in the county. Violence against women shall not be accepted. Violence against those experiencing homelessness shall not be accepted. Violence against those who have mental health or substance use issues shall not be accepted. Two, direct all county departments to not place future permanent shelter programs or temporary emergency or winter shelters at the Santa Cruz Veterans Memorial Building at 846 Front Street while Dave Pedley is an employee. Three, direct Housing for Health staff to not renew any contracts or partnerships with the Veterans Village program in Ben Loman while Dave Pedley is a part of the program and allowed on site and to immediately seek to li limit his access to clients as an employee within the partnership. If, ne if necessary, permit the Housing for Health staff to seek new partnerships to manage the program. Thank you, sir. Continuing the letter. Julie Mesosevic. Good morning. I'm Dr. Julie Mesosevic. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, but also the executive director at Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. So number four, direct Housing for Health staff to create a grievance system so that any contracted shelter, shelter site, shelter receiving HUD funding, or shelter operating in Santa Cruz County has a posted policy and procedures so that any client with a complaint can have it sent to Housing for Health for review rather than staying with the agency where the complaint issue occurred. Further, direct staff from Housing for Health to apply for funding to create a new homeless advocate staff position or contract for such a service to speak with clients and service providers and solve issues that arise through this process. If state and federal grant funding is not available, the Board of Supervisors is asked to prioritize funding such a position with staff recommendation of where that funding can come from. We at the Mental Health Advisory Board and Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center believe, as do you, that the health and wellness of all members of our community are important. Shelter services for those who are experiencing homelessness of any race, any gender identity, LGBTQIA+, or for those with any mental health issue or substance use issue, or who have any other disability, or for any vulnerable population whatsoever, should not be considered separate but equal. Whether the shelter is set up in response to an emergency weather event, a disaster, or some other reason, and whether the shelter services are provided by the county itself or another entity, all people deserve safety and dignity. Shelter services should be individualized, well-designed, well-run, and receive proper oversight from the county. We make this recommendation from both a place of compassion as well as a case for better outcomes from our programs and better engagement with some people who choose not to receive services due to these kinds of incidents. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. 
Good morning. My name is Jana Rivas. I am a program manager at Monarch Services. I run our confidential shelter program, and I am here in clear affirmation that we too believe that shelter spaces should be safe, trauma-informed for all persons of all genders and identifications, that a clear, transparent, and empowering process for every unhoused person in our community is established and supported by this board in the community so that folks can be heard and that they can um, understand their process and how they can be served within our community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, honorable board members. My name is Emily Chung. I'm the public health director for our public health division here in County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency. I want to thank the um, chair for signing a proclamation for next week, which is National Public Health Week. I'd like to take the opportunity to read this proclamation and um, honor our public health staff, as well as the whole community that serves in public health. Proclaiming our April 3rd through 9th, 2023 as National Public Health Week. Whereas the week of April 3rd through 9th, 2023 is National Public Health Week in recognition to the contributions of public health in improving health and achieving health equity, honoring the theme of centering and celebrating cultures and health. And whereas in the last year, the County Santa Cruz Health Services Agency Public Health Division continued leading the response to the local COVID-19 pandemic, responding to the MPOX outbreak, activated medical health resources to winter storm and flooding emergency shelters. And whereas the Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency Public Health Division and its committed workforce design and implement evidence and data-driven programs, ranging from health education, infectious disease mitigation and surveillance, public health nursing, and harm reduction through community collaboration, and whereas community partners are an extension of public health in preventing, preparing for, mitigating, and recovering from the impact of a full range of health threats, including disease outbreaks and climate change impacts, and whereas studies show that small strategic investments in disease prevention can result in significant savings in healthcare costs and an increase in local public health Spending contributes to decreases in infant deaths, deaths to di due to diabetes and deaths related to cardiovascular disease. And whereas the County of Santa Cruz Public Health Division is dedicated to fostering cultural connections, supporting our community's health and quality of life and recognize that race, place, culture and social determinants of health impact being, being able to make systems changes to the community health and well-being. So thank you for this proclamation. And one last thing I do wanna note is that um, Thursday is also National Doctors' Day and next behind me is Dr. Newell, our county doctor. So we wanna recognize all of our doctors in our community this week as well. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Dr. Newell, welcome back. Good morning. Dr. Gail Newell, County Health Officer, here to remind you that next week, as you've just heard, is National Public Health Week. And we have so much to celebrate. I'm very pleased to be with you here in person today, which hasn't happened enough during the past three weeks, three years. <laughs> Later this week, our local public health emergency will come to an end and our local state of emergency 30 days after that. We have a lot to celebrate. Although COVID-19 will be with us for the foreseeable future, the pandemic emergency has passed and the County of Santa Cruz fared far better than most. Thank you for your support, supervisors, CAO Palacios, County Council, Sheriff Hart and his team, and the countless others who supported the work of public health during these past three difficult years. It took every community member to practice public health during this pandemic. We thank them all. And while we mourn the precious lives lost, our county's mortality rate is one of the lowest in the state, even in the Bay Area, and less than half of the national average. But there's so much healing to do in the wake of the pandemic. Our community deserves enormous credit for coming together and doing the right thing to protect its most vulnerable members. So again, thank you to all. Community is where we are. It's our sense of belonging. It's our connections with others with whom we live, work and play. Over the past three years, these connections have been greatly impacted. Physically distancing from one another and limiting communal gatherings has led to social isolation, increasing rates of depression, impaired immunity and premature mortality. These outcomes are even worse in communities marginalized due to their race, income, sexual orientation, and gender identity. 
We have much to do. I urge you to use a health and all policies approach as you do your work, improve housing, education, food, transportation, and the environment to support equity, resilience, and health at the individual and community levels. Thank Fund you, programs Hill. to prevent unhealthy living conditions, and of course, support the public health workforce and their efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newell. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for your time. My name is Chris Cottingham, and I'm the executive director of the Santa Cruz County Veterans Memorial Building Board of Trustees. Uh, the Santa Cruz County Veterans Memorial Building Board of Trustees is the nonprofit that operates the Veterans Memorial Building in downtown Santa Cruz, the Veterans Village in Ben Loman, as well as several other programs supporting veterans, the community, and many of those experiencing homelessness. We have a strong reputation in the community for providing unbiased support, including shelter, food, medical services to all in our community that have fallen on hard times. We do not promote or support violence against anyone, including women, those that are experiencing homelessness and or those who suffer from mental health or substance issues. Seems like Mr. Cagno's account of the event is very different from our understanding of what happened. Immediately after the events on the 2nd of March, our staff made contact with the Santa Cruz County Police Department. They responded and interviewed our staff, reviewed the security footage, as well as interviewed other parties and determined there was no follow-up needed. It had seemed like the unfortunate situation was resolved without further incident. And at the time, we did not press charges against Ms. Cagno, Mr. Cagno for violating the no trespass order against him. We were very surprised to learn that this letter was being presented in the public forum for discussion without anyone contacting us to verify or fully understand the incident before presenting it publicly. We do take these allegations seriously and we will review our policies to ensure we remain prepared and committed to serve our entire community to the best of our ability. We will do so by ensuring our staff have the most up-to-date support and de-escalation training and remain committed to serving our most vulnerable with dignity and the respect they deserve. We will also continue to work with the County of Santa Cruz and the shelter operators to ensure there are clear options for participants to access facilities and services. We ask that the name of the employee be redacted from the public record. This is a personnel matter still under investigation, and we do not believe this is the right venue for discussion or defamation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. My name is Ray Krulicki. I'm a civil engineer, I'm an architect, and I'm a contractor. And I'm speaking for 70 people that live on College Drive. This is for Supervisor Felipe. You can see the 70 names. We're tired of being flooded out every five years. And the problem is very simple. It could be simply solved. In uh, San Jose, the mayor was bragging after the first rain, she dug out all the rivers and creeks and everything flowed fine. I hear rumbling in Monterey, the Pajaro River. The farmers want to dig the river out. They want to take the trees down like they did in 95. On College Drive, there is a five-foot culvert going under the road. And the culvert is filled with water in September and August. It doesn't rain in September and August. And I'm going to tell you, water goes downhill. It doesn't go uphill. And that's the problem. You have to dig the river down four feet at the bridge that was built in 1936. The last time the supervisors did anything in Santa Cruz County along the river that's around College Drive. It needs to be dug deeper. It's a simple solution. You don't spend a million dollars putting a pump in a lake to pump the water out. The river. The river flows, and when the river is high, the water pumps into the lakes because the water finds its own level. What you did is fine, but I would rather you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars digging the river deeper than renting pumps for five days at $1 million. Does that make a lot of sense to you? I'm asking you, you can comment. Nothing. 
Does that mean you're not going to do anything? Because 70 people are here to complain. And a woman on the street, College Street, wants to do a class action suit against the county. I don't want to see that because Thank guess you, who sir. Paid? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Morning, Gary Richard Arnold, uh, supervisors. Uh, some of you haven't been here all that long, uh, but we've continue uh, to have, like the gentleman there uh, was talking about, uh, the board refused and they got rid of the Citizens Appeals Board for planning, and they appointed themselves as such. And just like the man talks about physical stuff about water running downhill, the fulcrum of a eucalyptus tree is at its base when it's in water and on refuse and one falling over every six weeks. And I can't get a recall from my supervisor sitting right there that ran Civonomics that's supposed to get everybody engaged. Well, I had to wait for a lady to get out of her parking lot uh, to park there you can't go to the court or attend these meetings there were only five copies of the agenda out there this is deliberate we've had you know, people can see on tv there's all kinds of people back here designated speakers working for the county to burn up time you've adopted only two minutes to allow the people to talk and you blame that on neil coonerty you're the chairman now zach friend you work for uh john Kerry, who was a registered lobbyist for the red chinese bruce mcpherson's been working on this thing with palacios as ceo you go over to the headquarters palacios isn't here he received receives $3,065,000 a year in pay, and he's not even here. And Bruce McPherson, you're still receiving benefits by the Red Chinese. You got tens of thousands of dollars from communist Chinese by Patrice Lung. And you know it, and all of you support a... a, a uh, uh, two plaques on the courthouse steps dedicated to a red Chinese communist spy that helped kill your parents and your cousins and people in your family. This place is outrageous. And the reason why we have high gas and the cheapest inefficient energy is because of Bruce McPherson and Palacios following the U.N. agenda ICLEI 21. Get out of your back room. Get out of AMBAG. It's parallel Soviet government. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Board of Supervisors and specifically Supervisor Cummings. I live in your district where I am the mother of one of the three family court kidnapped Santa Cruz children. I've been coming here weekly. I am asking you for help. I was deeply disturbed to learn of Senate Bill 43, which is um, conservatorship reform and Assembly Bill 665, both of these bills would seek to expand medical kidnapping of children and our most vulnerable population. I would draw your attention to my letter written to the Santa Cruz City Council for today's agenda, item 14, which explains how easily medical doctors can be bought off to write false reports. I'm deeply concerned that Senate Bill 43 would seek a hearsay exemption for information contained in a medical record presented by an expert witness. This is absolutely not allowable. We cannot do that. That is our due process safeguards. And I'm horrified that there would be any bill to do this. I am horrified to hear that according to the Gateway Pundit, there is a state sanctioned kidnapping California Democrat that pushes a bill that would allow therapists to snatch children from parents without trial. Supervisor Cummings, I'm asking you to uh, support me in putting these bills down. They must not pass. And I'm asking for your help to get my daughter rescued from medical kidnap and the other two children who have been medically kidnapped. I would like to hear from you either via um, email to make an appointment with you and get these children rescued and not kidnap any more children by doctors who would be paid to tell lies. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you, Becky Steinberg, resident of rural Aptos. I first want to say I'd really like to see this barrier leave. Yours are all gone. Theirs are all gone. Our barrier is still here. It doesn't look good. Please take it down. 
Um, I want to support what the woman before me said. I have grave reservations about the large facility the county has now purchased across from this uh, sheriff's department at 5300 SoCal Avenue, where it will be a residential kids center for mental health. There's something that bothers me about that a lot, and this woman's testimony enforces that. I want to um, bring your attention to a letter that I see in your correspondence that I really hope you read and that you also respond to. It is a letter from Mr. Dave Martone from the Pajaro Valley Fire um, Protection District asking you to reconsider your allocation of Prop 172 public safety money. You know what this is. It was passed in 1992 to fund public safety, fire, and sheriff. This county gives zero, zero dollars to the fire protection districts out of the 20 million that we got last year from this permanent half cent statewide sales tax. You know that you can reallocate that. You know that you can do that, and it is time to look at that again because of the changing wildfire conditions and the needs of our county to prepare and to suppress those types of fire. Please read and respond to Mr. Dave Martone's letter. I'm very concerned about item number uh, 49, sharing information about vaccine hesitancy with the uh, National Association of County and City Health Officials. I don't think that is a good idea, and I want to protest the county spending in item number 63 million dollars to help the Aptos Village Project developer Swenson for their project and traffic things on SoCal Drive. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Morning, welcome back. Hey, good morning. What is it? It's uh, May, March 28th, 2023. This is the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors meeting. You know, it's really quite amazing the full house we have here. You know, I'm really appreciative that Sheriff Jim Hart is here and that Gail Newell is here. You know, I kind of came prepared to talk about a lot of things, but maybe I'll just focus on um, a conversation that came up on Sunday and I practiced boundaries. Someone clearly stated to a group that the current sheriff in this county, Jim Hart, is not a constitutional sheriff. Uh, it inspired me to practice boundaries, but write something that, you know, I'm just glad that I wrote. So... When you stand outside this building in front of the actual courthouse, you have two distinctly different U.S. flags. Distinctly different than these two flags that have a gold fringe upon them, which those are under maritime law. Those are pirate flags. So I didn't embarrass the person that's been teaching common law in this county for a while. But um, when anyone can go into the basement... And they can find a plethora of information, specifically information about the first U.S. Constitution that was published in 1787 with the first 10 amendments. And then the second U.S. Constitution that was published in 1789. And the third was published in 1790. Further, if you go through to the February 23rd, 1871 Organics Act, which created the Tri complex where the U.S. corporation in Washington, D.C. is just the military branch of the Vatican and the Bank of London. Um, and then you go to the creation of the tax identification number, where unfortunately most citizens don't realize that under the law they are corporate citizen slaves. I wish I had some more support. I'm glad these people are here. I'd like to talk to both Gail and Sheriff Jim Hart. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. How are you doing? Uh, Luke Rizzuto again, 408-590-2946. Uh, I have my client here that I've been trying to build her house here. It's going on three years now. <clears throat> Can't blame you all for the weather that we've had this year, of course, but uh, if the uh, planning department was more adept, uh, this house should have been built already. Uh, I do have pertinent information for you guys from 45 years of experience of the mistakes and stuff that your planning department's made here. I would like to be heard. I'm in Mr. Koenig's district. Uh, I'm, she's in your district, Mr. Uh, McPherson. And uh, I like having a young person 
uh, Mr. Cummins on the board. Uh, I think my generation and the previous generation screwed things up enough. And these codes that you're working off of maybe back to the 80s, for which Gary Patton stated at a meeting here, we can pass policy like this all day long because it's too expensive to test it in court. I was at that meeting. That's a quote, okay? I would suggest the younger generation here, which I'm happy to see, and experienced generation McPherson, you got to look at your planning codes here and you got to simplify. We've got to get people in their homes. You know, in the 80s and 90s, you had a growth factor of uh, allowed 3%. We were growing at 12%. So the first spec house I built and sold for $136,000 is 1.8 million today. So we're all stealing from our grandchildren. We really have to do something about this, okay? I appreciate what you go through, you guys. You're on the hot seat all the time. I don't wanna run. I've been asked to run for supervisor in this district for 12 times in the last two weeks. I don't wanna do it. I did six years on the school board. I had more fun getting shot at in the army. So I don't wanna do this. But please, please, you are the directors. You give the direction. You don't take direction. You give the direction. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Cindy McDonald, school teacher in East San Jose. Sorry. I want to go home. I want to go home. From the very first day that they cleared the debris, this county has lost my paperwork several times over and over. The second debris removal, which was not necessary because my paperwork was lost, it is now costing me another extra $100,000 for that, raping up my land. Please help us, we're running out of time. We do not have ALE money after August 20th. You're gonna have 900 people homeless because we can't afford the mortgage and rent. Please help us. I want to go home. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers I'd like to address us? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online for public comment? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Thank you. Carol, your microphone is now available. <laughs> uh, good morning. And wow, my heart really goes out to that last speaker. Um, and all the people who are looking to rebuild their homes, it's really unfortunate that they weren't able to get their homes built in the last, um, in 20, uh, 2020 or 2021 before all these rains have started in 22 and 23. It's really unfortunate. Um, but I'm actually here to speak about agenda item 49 on the consent agenda. I'm gonna ask that you all delete that item or at least amend it. It's about the vaccine hesitancy project. Um, a hallmark of an oppressive government is propaganda. Um, a hallmark of a free society is the empowerment of the people and the free flow of information. So um, if you guys don't delete it, then I would like to suggest that you amend it and that you use that money to purchase Dr. Thomas Cowan's book. He has a wonderful book. It's called The Truth About Contagion, Exploring Theories of How Disease Spreads. And you can place copies of the book. I would give the first copy to the public health department um, and the rest of the copies you could give to the County Office of Education, to all the schools, to all the libraries, so that we can empower the people to know the truth. Um, it's really unfortunate when the propaganda has continued for three years. It's astounding. And all we have to do is read a book to find out the truth. So I would encourage you all to get a copy of this book. And again, um, just share it with the community, um, you all can get a copy for yourself, educate yourselves so that you really do understand about the truth about contagion and you would, you would read about how disease actually spreads. Um, that way we would be a much healthier, much empowered community, much stronger, able to rebuild our lives and our homes. Thank you. Thank you. Call in user two, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, thank you for Carol Bjorn's uh, recommendation. I have the book right in front of me that she referred to, and I'd like to recommend uh, 
a few more sources of facts and evidence. The contagion myth, why viruses, including coronavirus in quotes, are not the cause of disease. So he refers to people being exposed to poison, contamination, radiation, uh, starvation, poor nutrition as true causes of disease. And I want to second Carol Bjorn's recommendation that you delete item 49 and put that money into um, uh, putting out truthful information, not facts. Another book is The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Another source is Weston A. Price Foundation, westonaprice.org. I have in front of me eight and a half, 11 sheet titled COVID shots for adults and children, what we know now. And there's a whole list of adverse reactions that are to be expected and documented. Why are you promoting big pharma's poisoning of people with these injections? And um, just one point here, in every clinical trial of COVID shots, nearly all participants reported adverse reaction, including high fever, chills, muscle pains, and headaches. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Documented. Thank you. Is there anybody else online, Madam Clerk? Yes. Barry Perlman, your microphone's now available. Thank you and good morning. Hi, my name is Barry Perlman. I live in the 4th District. We live outside Watsonville uh, at one of the lakes in Interlaken District. Um, we live just above Drew Lake. Uh, I'm here this morning to thank county government for the superb response uh, that I witnessed in the very first person. On March 10th, our property severely flooded. Our foundation of our home, which is 120 feet above Drew Lake, was completely unflooded. And uh, we have damage to the frame of our house and the foundation. And it was a pretty radical situation. Thank you, guys. I saw action. I saw people responding coming to my home, standing on my deck, which became a dock, and assessing the situation. I watched the various departments, public works, Matt Machado's people did a great job. Alex Sandoval, direct uh, uh, road superintendent, marvelous. Felipe's team, Ramon Gomez, marvelous. These people were hands on day after day after day, spending their time in the rain, overseeing the work. First of all, it was just terrific. Uh, you saved many of us. Thank you very much. And with that, I bid you a great day. Thank you. Colin user 1733, your microphone's now available. Call in user 1733. Um, hello, my name is Dr. Madeline Altman. Um, I'm calling regarding number 49. Um, continuing on what Carol and Marilyn were saying uh, regarding doing a deletion of, an, of this or perhaps an amendment, um, at the same time referring you to people who can give you information. Um, uh, to me, looking at this looks like it is from public health, which is who's been on here earlier today. Uh, public health uh, is wonderful for water and sanitation. They are Department of Defense. They are what they should be doing is helping people, not injecting them 
with viruses or some unknown, untested, unqualified, does not stop transmission, completely propagandized uh, situation. They need to get out of this. Money should not be going to that. There are many things in this county that money can go to. And again, uh, these things are causing the mental health, the disease, the diabetes. These are what they consider vaccine or what you call, whatever you want to call them, injections. Look at the CDC, not my word. They cause asthma. They cause diabetes. Please stop more of this. I don't know what vaccine hesitancy is. Um, somebody said something about surveillance. Um, we used to call it as doctors, HIPAA, privacy. You don't give information and specifically medical. If you see the word vaccine, think of it as drug. If you look at drug hesitancy, it is good. Thank you. Thank you. This is the last call for online speakers. Chair, we have one speaker left at this time. Mila, your microphone is now available. Yes, hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Yes, so um, I have a good words to say and maybe it will be finally heard by that board that silence is a violence. And I cannot get any response from this board. My email on March 13 was published and it was uh, email ending on March 13 and was beginning on November last year. I requested for urgent help and it's just outrageous because it's already 10 years like we got humiliated and destroyed by the care of health division. They're completely not doing their job for society. Instead, they trying to destroy society is very hard. I've heard here community, you know, bridges that they need money and they got a lot of money for their service. And they really provide help to people. Why you do not come that salaries for mental health employees. It's too many of them who does not have certification from California board and who's only doing a bad job and destroying people. I live in hell. My daughter lives in hell. Your brain was destroyed. Mind, soul, everything was destroyed. And your nervous system destroying right now every single day. We have no appropriate actions. We have no appropriate services. And this is just outrageous. Where is the district attorney? I would like to see district attorney here. Is he alive or he is not alive? Why it is impossible to get any appointment at the sheriff department to talk about that issue? They just uh, resist. And district attorney, the same thing. It Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We have one last speaker who's raised their hand. Call in user 1192. Your microphone's now available. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, this is Gail McCoonham, and I'd like to comment on an article from Reuters news agency via Yahoo Finance talking about insurance claims that have been paid out before the vaccine rollout <clears throat> in one agency called Agon. That was only 31 million. But after three quarters of aggressive vaccinations through 2021, the death benefit payouts hit 111 million, an increase of 258%. And here's the article, uh, part of the article. Dutch insurance insurer Agon, which does two thirds of its business in the United States, said its claims in the Americas in the third quarter were 111 million, up from 31 million a year earlier. U.S. insurers, MetLife and Prudential Financial, also said life insurance claims rose, <clears throat> rose South Africa's old mutual 
not really making sense in this sentence, but more of its pandemic provisions to pay claims and reinsure Reinsurer Munich Re raised its 2021 estimate of COVID life and health claims to 600 million euros from 400 million. This is an un, this is a historical increase in deaths from the United another website United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They talk about the fact that. Certain basic principles must be observed in order to satisfy moral, ethical, and legal concepts. Uh, I interject here that no animal trials have been done on this vaccine that we know of, and the vaccine manufacturers have not revealed the ingredients. <clears throat> so informed consent is not possible. The first uh, number of the 10 um, rules or suggestions of Thank the neuro is there anybody else, Madam Clerk? We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you. I'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for consent. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, is there any item you'd like to discuss on consent? Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Cummings. Uh, I did have a couple comments. Um, item number 34, which were the reappointments um, for the District 3 office. We received a letter yesterday from the um, person who was going to be reappointed for the mobile and manufacture home commission and they um, submitted a letter of um, thanks, but they were um, not wanting to um, continue on in that position. So that individual should be removed <laughs> from consideration for that item. Okay. Um, in addition to that, um, I just wanted to thank uh, staff item number 47, which is a mental health um, liaison grant for expanding the uh, mental health liaisons that are with the sheriff's department. Just want to thank the sheriff's department for applying for that. We know that we've been hearing a lot from members of the community who want to see us expand the number of um, social workers who are going out in the community, engaging with people who may be suffering from mental health issues. And so I think that will um, continue to add in our efforts on that front. Um, in addition to that, wanted to thank staff uh, with item number 48, <clears throat> um, which is a housing and homelessness incentive payment program for a street medicine pilot grant. And again, people who are, a lot of people wanting to see more teams going out and engaging with people who are experiencing um, homelessness. And this is an opportunity for us to expand medical services that are able to go out and engage with people who are where they're at um, rather than having to have people come into our facilities. And so increasing our ability to contact people who may need medical treatment who are homeless, um, but also being able to help connect them with services and hopefully get them housed. Um, I did have a question for um, staff and maybe uh, this is one for, for Matt Machado. It's on two items. Item number 62, which is um, the Recovery Center Modular Project Contract Approval and item number 65, which is the um, the crosswalk upgrade. And the only question I had is that it seemed like the initial base estimates for work were um, half of what the final bids were. And so I'm just wondering if maybe you could speak to that. So the first, in the, for item number 62, the base estimate was 545,000, but the final um, bid came in at 1.1 million. And then with 65, it was the base estimate was about 159,000. And then the lowest bid was 374. So I'm just wondering if you can maybe just clarify why we're seeing that big a difference in the sure. base estimate versus what the bids are coming in at. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. Matt Machado, uh, Deputy CAO and Director of CDI. I'll take 65 first, and then uh, Damon uh, Adlow will address 62. So on... Um, Wait, 60, yeah, 65. And so this is a very unique contract, a very specialized equipment. We don't normally bid these out as standalone small projects. And so our experience with estimating this uh, unique equipment, specialized equipment, is is less than our normal experience with, you know, bid bidding road projects and such. Uh, that also explains why we only had one bid. And so it's specialized equipment, uh, it's unique. Uh, it is a critical project I'll share and, uh, uh, we also worked with Caltrans. They recognized the criticality of it as well and funded the entire project. It's 100% grant funded. Uh, we do think that the bid is a good bid. We also think that the price is fair. It's just our estimate was off because of our, you know, experience in this very unique uh, equipment. 
area. So uh, we're making a solid recommendation to the board today. And so hopefully that explains it. Specialized equipment and, you know, construction costs are up a bit too, but I think specialized equipment is driving the, driving the cost, but it is 100% grant funded, which means that Caltrans recognizes the, the value in it as well. Uh, for item 62, I'll turn it to uh, Damon to address that one. Hello, uh, Board of Supervisors. I'm Damon Adlau, Project Manager with uh, CDI. So yeah, with um, item 62, uh, we initially had a, an engineer's estimate, which honestly was just a lot lower um, you know, than we had thought. It was about a three, basically about a three-year-old um, estimate. We thought we had applied appropriate um, escalation to it. We hadn't. Uh, once we received the bids, we actually took some time to test the numbers, essentially, with unit pricing that we had. We were pretty close. Um, the other um, issue was that we only had one bidder. As, um, as explained to us kind of during the storms, it was just difficult for folks to get there. We, but again, once we tested those numbers, it felt like um, it was within a reasonable uh, range. And that by going out to bid with the time involved that we wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily result in lower prices. And that's why we recommend moving forward with it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all my questions and comments. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor McPherson. Uh, two items, uh, item number 20, the Branch 40 and Scotts Valley Fire District consolidation. I'm glad to see this uh, work to consolidate the two fire districts. I think whenever it makes sense to consolidate smaller agencies to better serve our residents, it's a, it's a good, uh, if it makes good financial sense. Uh, I know that the Scotts Valley Fire District will do the best job it can to serving its new customers in the former Branch 40 service area. Um, and item 35, the fire suppression bill. I want to thank uh, the little supervisor, Justin Cummings, for coming to me to co-sponsor this item. As we all know, uh, greater clarity about FEMA's role in supporting local governments and covering costs uh, of hazard mitigation, uh, as well as providing post-disaster response is most welcome. Um, federal le legislation like this uh, is to plug some of those gaps is good, and I hope there's uh, more forthcoming about FEMA's responsibility to provide their support in a timely and predictable way. Uh, this hasn't been the ca case for the past several years and is substantially impacting our county budget due to lack of reimbursement for the county-related uh, uh, incidents uh, to CZU fire and the COVID response. Um, and we're in the neighborhood of $70 million that we think should be coming to us, but um, we're just going to continue to press for that. And uh, I, I appreciate you bringing this to us. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I also want to comment on item 20, the merger between Branson 40 Fire Protection District and Scotts Valley Fire Protection District. Uh, and, and just want to congratulate these two agencies. I know for Brant's 40 Fire, it's not easy to give up its identity in this way, but the agency did some hard work and ultimately put their residents' best interest in efficient fire service above any personal pride. This merger is a wonderful example of public service. It's an example of putting service above self. On item 32, I want to accepting the nomination of Julie Peterson for appointment to the Santa Cruz Monterey Merced San Benito Mariposa Managed Care Medical Care Commission. I want to thank Ms. Peterson for volunteering for this position as hospital representative on the Health Alliance Commission. She's extremely qualified as the chief financial officer at Watsonville Hospital today. And before that was CFO at Dominican and Sutter for a combined 17 years and has 25 years of experience in the healthcare field. Ultimately, a strong working relationship between Watsonville Hospital and the Alliance is crucial uh, for their long-term success. So I think this will be a great appointment. And then finally, on item 67, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District grant for 17th Avenue Adaptive Signal Project. I want to thank and congratulate Public Works staff on the successful uh, grant award of $200,000 and hope we can find the remaining funds needed to implement this important project as soon as possible. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. I'll briefly comment on a few items on items 58 and 59. Um, appreciation to Mr. Wiesner for continuing to stick with the 2017 storm damage repairs. These were major damage areas within my district um, that have now been completed. On item 64, uh, Mr. Adlow, thanks for your continued work on the Aptos Library. I think the solar is going to be uh, an amazing addition to it, and it's exciting to see that it'll, it'll provide enough power to cover it for 20 years. Uh, it is an absolutely stunning project. Every time I go by it, it's uh, it's just a, a beautiful monument for future generations. So I appreciate your work on that. 
Okay, so we'll bring it back uh, to the board, recognizing that we need to amend item 34, striking uh, Mr. Allenbaugh from one of the considerations. But if we could have a motion, please. I'll move consent. Second. So we have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez with the one change on item 34. Uh, if we could have a roll call, please. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. And so we'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is to consider item seven, which is to consider approval of a new access to medical care agreement with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan Incorporated and Kaiser Foundation Hospitals Incorporated and take related actions. As outlined in the memo of the Director of Health Services, we have the agenda board memo, as well as the access to medical care agreement with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and Kaiser Foundation Hospitals. Uh, with us today, we'll have um, Monica Morales, the director of our health services agency, and uh, Tiffany Kentrell Warren, the director of our behavioral health division. Director Morales, good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for having us here this morning. Uh, just a quick reminder on uh, December of 2019. Oh, thank you, Carlos. Should I project? It is on. Can you hear me now? Is that a little better? Okay, great. So on December 2019, uh, the board directed HSA uh, to negotiate a new agreement with Kaiser. At that point, Kaiser had entered the Santa Cruz market the year prior um, to this directive. After about a year and a half of uh, negotiating with Kaiser, uh, we bring forward to the board a consideration to approve the access to um, medical care agreement with Kaiser. Um, just want to take us back a little bit and remind uh, the board that we currently have access to medical care agreements with three health systems in our county, Dignity Health, also known as Dominican, with Sutter, um, and Watsonville Community Hospital. The access to care agreements are really the intent and the goal is to ensure that the largest health systems in our county provide inpatient emergency and other healthcare services to our poor and low income and indigent patients. It's really our attempt to ensure that all of us are caring for uh, our populations most in need. Um, Kaiser can fulfill its agreements very similar to the categories we have with existing plans right now. So these include contributions to charity care, uncompensated care uh, for non-Kaiser patients, grants for health needs, as well as um, recruitment of physicians that will serve non-Kaiser patients. Uh, Tiffany will jump into the details with you this morning to showcase more what the agreement entails. I want to uh, extend our <coughs> gratitude to Valerie Lomax, Evelyn Tran, and Irene Chavez from Kaiser, who really worked with us for the past two years to ensure that this agreement came forward to the board for consideration. Mm -hmm. I'm also in deep appreciation to our team members, Tiffany, who really spent a lot of time thinking through the concept of this agreement to ensure that it was fair and it matched and it was balanced compared to the current agreements that we have. And Mary Chavez for her ongoing research um, to ensure that we had and were mirroring also the commitments that we currently have. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to transition now to Tiffany who will um, give you guys more detail and we'll be here to answer your questions. Thank you. So a little bit of history about the state law. It requires that nonprofit hospitals assume an obligation to provide community benefits in exchange for their tax exempt status. California also requires hospitals to submit to the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, the hospital community benefit plans and annual reports, and also to assign an economic value to the charity care, uncompensated costs of care, and other community benefits that those hospitals provide. The state does not, however, require a minimum contribution amount of community benefit from each hospital. So in Santa Cruz County, we leverage the access to medical care agreement to achieve a minimum annual community benefit contribution amount from nonprofit hospitals and health systems that are operating in our county. 
the access to medical care agreements enshrine shared commitments to Santa Cruz County residents. Santa Cruz County does not have a county hospital. And in a smaller population county, residents are best served through partnerships that allow access to medical care for specialty services for people regardless of who their insurance payer is. It's a very delicate balance um, in a small county such as this. The access to medical care agreements made by Santa Cruz County hospital providers ensure that specialty care, inpatient care, and emergency department services are available to our Medi-Cal beneficiaries and other um, county indigent patients. And this is really important because 33% of Santa Cruz County residents have Medi-Cal. So here is a summary of the community benefits required and provided by each of the health systems where the county has a current access to medical care agreement. This is for the most recent reporting year 2020. It was brought to this board um, through the consent agenda on February 28th of this year. And so you'll see that for Dominican, the required contribution of care amount is $7 million. And ultimately in 2020, Dominican contributed 11.5 million. For Sutter, the required care amount is 2 million. And they came in just a little shy of that. And for Watsonville Community Hospital, the required care amount is 1.9 million for 2020. And ultimately they provided $2.3 million in community benefit. So the County Health Services Agency has negotiated the agreement before you today with two parties that we will collectively refer to as Kaiser. That is both the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan Inc., which is the health insurance plan, and Kaiser Foundation Hospitals Inc., which is the hospitals and the medical offices. This is a 10-year agreement that begins last year in 2022. The parties can agree to revisit or renegotiate certain provisions upon mutual agreement in 2025. The annual required commitment of community benefit for this agreement will be calculated as 2% of Kaiser Health Plan's annual commercial dues received from Santa Cruz County residents. Um, because Kaiser does not have a large hospital facility footprint in this county, and because Kaiser operates as not only a direct medical service provider, but also as a health insurance plan, this agreement with Kaiser pays a minimum required community benefit to a percent of the commercial health plan's revenue, which Kaiser is intrinsically motivated to grow. The existing access to medical care agreements that were made with hospitals in the 70s and in the 90s, and those hospitals later joined with large health systems, those agreements pay the minimum required community benefit to a percent of the operating expenses of their large hospital facilities. So the result here is that in the reporting year of 2022, Kaiser's minimum required community benefit will be approximately $4.5 million. We can compare that to, for example, Sutter's minimum required community benefit for the last reporting year, which I showed you on the previous slide, was $2 million. So without having a large facility footprint, Kaiser's minimum community benefit requirement will still be double what Sutter's is in the existing access to medical care agreements. So this arrangement ensures that as Kaiser's business in Santa Cruz County grows, so does its community benefit to our county. This arrangement also maximizes the benefit to the community of Kaiser being not only a direct medical service provider, but also a health plan. And this is different than the other health systems operating in our county whose historic agreements are tied to their hospital facilities operating expenses. So now I'll describe the multiple ways that Kaiser can fulfill the minimum community benefit contribution to our county. Kaiser can fulfill its annual community benefit contribution through provision of charity care or uncompensated costs of care to non-Kaiser patients who are residents of our county. The non-Kaiser patients includes individuals who are uninsured or who have non-Kaiser Medi-Cal, non-Kaiser Medicare, um, government insurances. This care must be provided in Santa Cruz County Kaiser facilities 
Um, it must be provided by, it can also be provided by Kaiser physicians who are operating in our county, including those operating at Watsonville Community Hospital. It can be provided via telemedicine to residents within Santa Cruz County. And it can be provided by Kaiser physicians who are practicing outside of the county, but only for procedures or services that are not available within Santa Cruz County and where the physician believes that the best care can be provided elsewhere. However, at least 50% of charity care that's counted towards the annual commitment must be provided within the geographic boundaries of Santa Cruz County. Kaiser cannot count the value of care provided to its own members as part of the annual required community benefit. So what this agreement does that the existing access to medical care agreements do not is it caps the financial value of charity care and uncompensated costs of care to the most recently approved CMS Medicare fee-for-service rates for Santa Cruz County plus 20%, which we believe more accurately reflects the true cost of care than what hospitals currently report to the state HCI in their community benefit reports and what the hospitals report to the county in their access to medical care reports. So Kaiser can also fulfill its annual community benefit contribution through grants made to nonprofits um, that support any of the top five health needs that are identified in either Kaiser's internal community health needs assessment for this area or the joint community health needs assessment that is developed in partnership with the public health department and the other health systems. So here we focus the grants um, on what can be counted towards community benefit on those five highest needs that are identified by our community. Kaiser can also fulfill its annual community benefit contribution through recruitment of physicians to the Santa Cruz County area who must be based in Santa Cruz County and must provide care to Medi-Cal Medi and Medicruz, which is the county indigent patients. Here, though, we've capped the physician recruitment expenses that can be counted in this agreement at $150,000 per physician. Keep in mind that many provider medical groups may spend upwards of $400,000 recruiting specialty care physicians, and that the current access to medical care agreements do not cap the per physician recruitment expenses that can count towards the minimum annual community benefit contribution. Kaiser also made many noteworthy contributions to the Pajaro Valley Healthcare District and project in the past year, which were crucial to pulling the Watsonville Community Hospital out of bankruptcy and returning it to community ownership. Kaiser can count towards its annual community benefit contribution, those in-kind services, which include consulting, accounting, and administrative services, or the grants that were made to the health district to acquire the hospital for public ownership. There is the initial grant of $3 million that Kaiser made, and then also a $4.5 million pledge that Kaiser made and will be um, paid in three installments starting this year. In-kind services that Kaiser counts towards the minimum annual community benefit contribution must have a monetary value assigned to it that is mutually agreed upon by Kaiser and the Watsonville Community Hospital leadership. This agreement requires annual reporting via the access to care worksheet, which will provide the amount of the annual commitment for the reporting year and the amounts expended in contributions towards that annual commitment. The report submission will also include an external auditor's report, an annual report of the grants and the physician recruiting expenses that Kaiser is counting towards fulfilling the annual commitment. The Health Services Agency has negotiated this agreement with Kaiser over the past 16 months. This is the only such agreement that Kaiser has signed with any county. The Health Services Agency believes that this is the best negotiated agreement that ensures Kaiser will make impactful community benefit contributions to our county for the benefit of our residents. Therefore, we recommend that your board consider approval of a new access to medical care agreement with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan Inc. and with Kaiser Foundation Hospitals and authorize the Health Services Agency Director or designee to sign the agreement and any future agreements as approved by County Council. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna open it up for questions. I, I have some questions to start it off, that's okay. 
Um, and I also understand and appreciate that uh, KP has representatives here as, as well. I appreciate you being here if there are questions. So I appreciate the work on this. This has been a long road, obviously, since we first started this process. The access to medical care agreements at their core are to increase medical medical patient access uh, within our county. And so when I was looking at the annual reporting components here, it provided information about the number of physicians that were hired under the recruitment, their names, et cetera, where the money was spent, maybe on community-based organizations, on the community benefit donation element of it. But what metric is there to actually show that it increased access for Medi-Cal patients? How would we know in the annual reporting that the capacity has actually increased as a result of the agreement for local Medi-Cal patients? Um, that's a great question. You know, what we're trying to do in the reporting piece is for us to note what percent of uh, what amounts each health system is actually contributing that they're not actually getting any other payment for, and we're actually writing off in a way. So for us, that's a demonstration, although we can't count the exact individual's name or you know where in the county that might be, by us being able to document that they're actually providing some form of grant, some form of charity care, um, for us that denotes that they're helping in our community. But we know how many Medi-Cal patients there are in our county. I mean, basically the alliance functionally. I mean, I mean, so we we know. So couldn't we then see whether there's an increase in access specifically of those receiving Kaiser services as a result of the agreement once we effectuate this? Yeah, great point. Um, we are discussing with the alliance the possibility of also looking at the data that they're collecting and what percent or what number of folks are going to now be able to uh, be served by Kaiser or refer to Kaiser. So those are preliminary discussions that we're having right now to try to also uh, document this agreement. Do you have a sense, because it was unclear in reading through all the documentation here, um, I'm not a Kaiser patient personally, and so I can't access Kaiser services. I mean, so since it's a closed system by definition, who, what new Medi-Cal patients will have access to the Kaiser system based on what you were just saying? Is it just those with the direct agreement that are being made with the state, or is it actually those uh, that right now don't have access to specialty care that are currently members of the Alliance? Will they have access, for example, to Kaiser specialists as a result of this agreement? And if not, how? why not? Or if so, how will we know based on the reporting? Yeah, that's an interesting question, just considering what's going on right now with the state and DHCS agreement with Kaiser. Um, right now, what we understand is that information is being negotiated um, at the state level with DHCS and Kaiser. So there's going to be some, we know in the future, starting 2024, there's going to be some Kaiser and DHCS negotiations in terms of a number of patients that will be entering the Kaiser um, market more concretely. In terms of this agreement, um, you know, we typically right now are not even doing that with the current health systems to document how they operationalize that. We do obviously see it in the reporting um, in terms of the charity amounts that go to a community or the in kind that they're providing in care. But we currently don't break that down even with the 16 contracts. So we can look into that to see um, you know, okay. what we can do in the future. I mean, the other the other systems are fundamentally different though, right? They're not closed, they're not closed systems. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, they're accepting uh, because they don't have a choice, people into the Dominican, you know, the, maybe in the ER or whatever it may be. And and uh, or right now, if you're an alliance or uh, or a member of, of any of the local nonprofit health systems, the only way you have access to the specialists is through PAM for Dignity. And so I don't know how, I mean, I would be happy to get more data collection on the Sutter slash PAMF and, and Dignity Common Spirit sort of world, but I think that it's not an apples to apples comparison, which is what the, so what I'm, what I'm hearing is in particular with the change at the state is that it sounds like the agreement should be looked at as a starting point and not an end point in particular with the annual reporting requirements, we should probably get more robust data back. And there should be an understanding and expectation on the KP side that this is a starting point and come 2024, 2025, because we're going to have a better understanding of what new or not new Medi-Cal patients will be taken within our system. I mean, I grew up 
in Southern California, and, and they're a direct contractor. Kaiser is a direct, it's a different system down there. They take a set of Medi-Cal patients in this area. That's not the case fundamentally. And so what I don't necessarily want is somebody getting credit for physician recruitment, for example, to take patients they were going to take anyway as a part of a direct deal with the state. This is about adding capacity to an, a burden system. And the lowest, um, those with the lowest in our, uh, level of access in our community that need uh, the specialty care are kind of relying on these agreements in order to provide that. And that's what I'm, what I would like to see this agreement do or additional reporting do, because I'm, I'm not convinced that this actually adds capacity beyond what was already going to be provided through the direct agreement. And I could be wrong. Um, but that if, if the fundamental need here and the fundamental point of access to, to medical care agreements is to increase capacity, I don't know that the agreement actually does it. And that's what I want to make sure um, moving forward it does. So I have, I have a final question. I apologize for monopolizing the time here. Um, one thing that is, since it's not an apples to apples comparison, one thing I do think has been expressed to me by a number of the local uh, nonprofit and indigent care providers is a, is a fear that what would happen or what's the plan be if PAM for Dignity were to also, uh, these other large health systems were to only limit access to those that are linked directly to their health systems, which is something that they have been discussing about a potential need just from a financial standpoint. So when we're renegotiating their agreements, which come up in a few years as well, what is our plan if that were to be something that they did? So if they took the same approach that KP and it became a closed system internally to our county, what would we do for assuring that that Medi-Cal population has the same access now and an expanded access moving forward? Let me clarify something. I know Tiffany wants to add on. Um, remember that the categories also that we're talking about is for uncompensated care, right? So even though someone might have Medi-Cal, um, what we're looking for is areas that are not actually current, currently being built or paid for. The other category is grants. Um, so and physicians, obviously. So this is not just like double dipping in a way. We're looking and computing opportunities where they're actually providing care that they haven't been able to get paid for. So if that's an easier way to think about um, the agreement as well. And that's the case too with our existing health plans. And you're absolutely right about the direct agreement that Kaiser can enter into with, with the state. And I know that that was brought to this board last year. Um, and the board did um, request that we sign on to a letter in opposition at that time. But also that legislation did pass with a few modifications. So that is the system that we're operating in. And we don't have a lot of control over that. I think um, my understanding is that the county cannot require any hospital or health system to contract with another. And so what these agreements do, and Jason can correct me, that's, yeah, we can't, we can't require them to contract um, with the Alliance um, or with each other. But what we've tried to do in this agreement is set up the incentives where Kaiser would be able to count towards this minimum, you know, we put a dollar amount on it that's attached again to their um, to their revenues where there would be a minimum contribution and they could um, reach that minimum contribution by counting uncompensated costs of care. And one of the ways they can do that is through serving those non um, Kaiser Medi-Cal right now. That's all Medi-Cal is not Kaiser in this county. So they could be serving those individuals. And the primary way, at least in 2022 and 2023, that they would be serving them is at the Watsonville Community Hospital. And, and I wasn't, look, I'm not trying to enter into an antitrust conversation where we're requiring anything. Like I get the legal component of it. What I'm saying is that at, at its core, so 50,000 foot view, the, the purpose of the agreement is increasing access to medical patients. I mean, does it do it? Yes or no. We, what it sounds like, we don't actually know. And so what I'm saying is that then from a baseline standpoint, I think that the board should probably provide additional direction, at least on the annual reporting component to make sure that we're getting information that helps inform the renegotiation of contracts moving forward, not just for Kaiser, but for the other health systems as well. I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with moving forward. With, I mean, I also think that, that we need to move forward with something. Like I get, I get where we are. I'm a realist about that. But I also wanna make sure that because of the evolving nature of what's going on with the direct agreement of the state, because of everything from Cal, all these other, these other changes that are occurring to the system across the state, that we have uh, very directed check-ins about whether or not this agreement is actually increasing access for the most, the most vulnerable in our community. And 
Um, that seems reasonable. And I think that that actually seems like our responsibility. And so that, that's where I'm trying to get at. I mean, I'm not talking about a direct, um, you know, forcing anybody to contract with anybody on the antitrust side. I just mean that, that I don't think that the agreement necessarily speaks to that, or we just don't, we don't know at this point. That was where I am. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. Um, first, I just want to be clear about uh, what what are we giving, what is the county giving Kaiser in exchange for this agreement? Is it simply sort of a validation that they're acting in a charitable capacity within our community and in accordance with state law? So we don't, we're not getting, in, let me back up. We're not giving anything to Kaiser. We have existing agreements with health systems to ensure that we're increasing access to care. Because they came into the market in 2018, the board directed us to also create a similar agreement with Kaiser. So in essence, that's what we're trying to do is increase access to our indigent population in, in our community uh, through a, an agreement with Kaiser. Right, no, I, mean, I understand the goal. Um, so it's basically just to sort of comply with the uh, intent of state law that, um, that nonprofit health systems are acting in a way that expands capacity. Or, I mean, we, can, we can't deny any operator or any healthcare provider from operating in the county, right? That is correct. Right. Okay. Um, now, in determining this 2% uh, that, that Kaiser would contribute annually towards charitable care um, and related services, was there a general attempt to make sure that Kaiser's contribution is similar to other, the other healthcare providers? I mean, that's, that was the general goal. Yes. Okay. Um, now, I know we have a target of renewing the access to medical care agreements with Dominican, Sutter, and Watsonville Hospital by June of this year. That, that's just sort of an aspirational target, right? There's no requirement that we do that? The requirement, um, you provided as a directive, where we mm -hmm. knew that everybody was going to want to see the current agreement with Kaiser. They were waiting for that. Um, so we anticipate that now that this is public, we'll actively start moving forward with renegotiating those agreements. Most likely to be fair with everything we have going on with the emergency response, we'll probably come back to you and request an extension to move through those agreements. Okay, got it. Um, I mean, I think that's I think that's probably a good idea to delay those agreements a little bit too, because I mean, what, what I've heard and what I what I see in the memo here is that there's actually a pretty big gap in those current agreements, right? And I'll, and I'll just read it, which is both charity and uncompensated care are based on costs incurred for eligible low-income patients not already covered by a current or future form of government-supported healthcare entitlement programs such as Medicare, Medi-Cal, or Medi-Cruz. So, uh, you know, the, the health systems, if they... They're taking a lot, I mean, a lot of Medicare and Medi-Cal patients. That's just the nature of our community, right? But we if if Medicare and Medi-Cal don't pay the full cost of care, we don't count the gap in their costs in terms of this accounting. I mean, is that correct? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Are you saying the dip some sure, so sure. Let's just say I'm Dominican and I take a Medi-Cal patient. And the cost of their care is $100,000. Uh -huh. And Medi-Cal reimburses me $30,000. Now, there's a $70,000 gap there. Mm. That's not accounted for in our current access to care agreements with, with Dominican, right? It, I believe it is. We'll have to go back and look at the accounting methodology for that and the reports. But there is um, like a factor that reduces how much they're allowed to count. <laughs> Okay. I mean, because I mean, even the memo sort of makes it clear that it's not. I mean, it, what I just read said that it's not. Uh, and then it further goes on that the, you know, the original access to medical care agreements established in 1973 and 1993 have not been updated since the Affordable Care Act implementation, as well as the passage of AB 204 in 2019, which did require all hospitals, whether or not for profit or for profit, to publicly report community benefits and more clearly defines community benefits including the unreimbursed cost care of unreimbursed cost of providing services to Medi-Cal or Medicare beneficiaries. So basically, and I think it was what, yeah, 2019, AB 204 added this clarification that the state, and maybe this is in the state report that the healthcare providers are, are it is providing, in the state report. but not in the part of our access to care agreements. So, I mean, my basic concern here is that there's possibly a very large 
gap in terms of what we're consuming. We're trying to create a level playing field. There could be a fairly large gap in terms of what the current healthcare providers are actually doing for our community and what we're seeing on paper. I mean, so when you say, okay, Sutter is providing $2 million worth of charity care a year, that doesn't account for all of the unreimbursed care they're providing to Medicare and Medi-Cal patients. And I think that could be significant. Supervisor. And oh, I'm sorry, please, yeah. I didn't realize you were done. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, and I mean, as Chair Friend was was suggesting, I think the the concern here is that if if Kaiser has effectively created a way to block many Medicare and Medi-Cal patient, I mean, patients from receiving care under their system, that the existing healthcare providers in our community could effectively say, well, we have to do the same to stay competitive. And, you know, maybe we can't deny them, they can't deny them from the emergency room, but, you know, it's the, the uh, certain physicians could decide they're not going to take those patients. And so I, I think that's why, you know, to, again, to Chair Friend's point, it's important to look at how many uh, folks are being helped who are on these government insurance plans, you know, net across our community as these, um, as the situation evolves. But those are all my comments. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Do you have anything? No, no, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair. And first, I just want to thank you all for your hard work on bringing this agreement to us because um, it sounds like there's been a lot of work that's been put into this. And, you know, the intent is really to try to get us to help expand medical care to, um, you know, some of our lowest income residents. And based on on what I was able to read in the staff report, this agreement will also help to really expand medical care in South County as it relates to Watsonville Community Hospital and hopefully bringing more specialized care into the community. So I just want to acknowledge the work that you all put into this. Um, I did have a question because I do share, um, you know, the fact that this is a new program, this is a new agreement. I do share um, some of the concerns expressed by uh, Chairman Friend and um, Supervisor Koenig really around tracking um, how this, um, how we're able to track who's receiving benefits over time. And I know that um, part of the direction is that we, um, you know, more or less, we authorize the health service agency director or designee to sign the agreement and any future amendments. Uh, and so I'm just curious, are there, what is anticipated in terms of how this might change and what kind of amendments we might see made to this over time? And have we seen changes to previous agreements? Because I think that with this being new, you know, having this come back to the board so we can track how it's progressing over time would be helpful for us to kind of, um, you know, to be able to see that it's being effective and that we're understanding how it's rolling out. Yeah, it was our intent um, from the PowerPoint, if you can note, that we knew we had to come monitor this agreement and come back to the board. We come back to you and report annually on all the health systems and their contributions. We know that um, some of these are have been in place since the 1970s and 80s, these agreements. So we're aware that so much has changed in healthcare delivery, um, the state, the, the federal government coming up every year, obviously, with new uh, policy. So that's our intent right now. Um, you can see clearly that we'll be working closely with Kaiser coming back in, uh, in 2025 is around the corner for us. So truly next year, we kind of sit down all together and start looking at this agreement and seeing what the changes might be that might be revisited. The discussions with um, Sutter and Dominican and Watsonville will occur and all the feedback that you're providing to us will use it to think about how we will mold those agreements as well. Um, with, you know, there is a lot of opportunity and limitations at the same time. And so we we'll need your guidance and advice as we move forward through these to ensure that you feel it's actually also beneficial to your residents, um, to your constituents here in the community. So any future feedback, you know, that you have, please let us know and we're collecting it as well um, to think about specifics that you want to see in the future agreements. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, Justin mentioned some of the some of the contributions that Kaiser made in South County specifically to 
make sure that we keep the hospital uh, low and continue with the hospital district. So I'm appreciative of that portion of that. And you know, I was listening uh, to Supervisor Koenig's comments, but I, one of the things that I think that I think all the hospitals are in that similar situation too, where that 70, 30 gap exists for all of them. And it's difficult to look at, um, you know, those state regulations that kind of set those, those criteria for, uh, for, you know, hospitals and, and for us, it, it's the same. It kind of reminds me of those, the public comment earlier when they talked about our, our uh, archaic planning regulations that we had, uh, from the 80s that we've got to change, but some of those are state regulations that we have. Um, and it's true, we got to change those eventually, but some of those are, you know, not at this dais to change, but at the state, um, uh, state legislators' uh, dais to change. But, you know, I think that in terms of uh, equity, I think in terms of charitable uh, contributions, I think that that's one way that we can look at uh, Kaiser and uh, push push them to continue to uh, contribute in that way as well. Um, but I think those are my comments. And I appreciate what they've done in South County in terms of the hospital district. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I, I really appreciate the concerns that have been raised um, by the chair, a friend and Supervisor Koenig. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is this, this type of an arrangement has never been done before and um, I'm not sure. Well, we're going to have to just look back two years from now or sometime in the near future and say, okay, this is good or this is not so good. Um, I, on balance, I think this is better than what we have without coming to any agreement. Uh, that's just my basic thought at this time, but I'm open to hearing any um, public comment as well. Thank you. I, I agree. I mean, I think it's a, a starting point. We'll open it up for the community. Uh, if there's members of the community that would like to address us on this in chambers. Yeah, good morning. I must admit uh, here I was thinking I was gonna have difficulty staying on topic, but I were to just quote some stuff, you know, double dipping, 50,000 foot view. What is the county giving Kaiser? What is What are the medical endeavors for our community? Oh, I could really go anywhere with this. So uh, it's just great to be in observation in quite the last couple of days doing research. I mean, I suppose I could talk about the effects of uh, what hospitals like Kaiser have been promoting and how they've actually been affecting the inhabitants. I'll just read one title. MNRA vaccines are a sham. People are being injected with nanotech. Now, I spent quite a few hours going through over a thousand pages and just printed up some, but who cares? I wasn't actually finding what I was looking for and I had to do other things. So I really find it fascinating how beguiling the situations are. And I'm just going to read a definition of the Delphi technique. Our objective is to get the answers we want and make citizens think they're participating in the public process, all the while the decisions have already been made beforehand. You know, that's just not deluding the public. It's actually deluding you members as um, supervisors who are really under the control of the county manager, Carlos Palacios. So what can we actually do with what's going on with uh, what seems to be fraud? You know, I like this definition of Western medicine, and that's Western medicine is petrochemical finance, sickness over health, profits over cures, written by a doctor who after 20 years was no longer a doctor. She wrote a book called Medical Mafia. 76% of the people trust their doctors. Only 6% trust, trust their politicians and the doctors are run by the politicians. I'm here to witness change. Thank Thanks. you. Anybody else in chambers like to address this on this item? Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner from Rural Aptos. Um, 
I want to thank you, Supervisor Koenig, for asking the question, what is the county giving to Kaiser for this? That's been my question, too. And we're not at all talking about the huge uh, medical complex that Kaiser has in the works uh, to build with a four-story parking garage adjacent on SoCal Avenue. That seems to be stalled. And I was told that Kaiser actually wanted to buy Watsonville Community Hospital was discouraged from doing so. That delay caused them a lot of problems with their permitting for their uh, plans to build a huge hospital in the Mid-County area. Why are we, uh, what are we giving them now? <laughs> And why is there no talk about this project and how that's going to fit in with this agreement? Um, I appreciate Chairman Friend's persistence in wanting better data tracking and actual proof that this agreement will benefit uh, uh, those who are who are not able to pay. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable that Kaiser will be given the ability to use the $3 million that they gave to the Watsonville hospital buyout or the cost of consultation and administration. That's a very vague um, condition. And if we allow Kaiser to write this off, essentially, their donation to Watsonville hospital, will Dominican and Sutter, who also uh, contributed large dollar amounts, also want this favor? How will this affect the uh, Kaiser members that are paying for this this uh, Kaiser's ability? Um, if this is the only county that Kaiser is making these agreements with, are their cost of membership and their level of service going to um, be changed? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Okay, seeing none, Madam Clerk, people online? Yes. Thank you. Larry, your microphone is now available. Uh, can, you hear, can you hear me okay now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, well, this has been a great conversation. And I did, I appreciate that the board had an opportunity to receive my uh, email yesterday where I, I described my 40 year history in, in the county. I'm a retired physician on a, on a multitude of, of state boards. I've been on the Alliance board with Monica and, and supervisor friend uh, for over 15 years. Um, there, uh, let, let me just say that we have a crisis in access in this county. Crisis for, for not just Medi-Cal and uninsured, but Medicare patients as well. So supervisor friends uh, question of how will this help access? This will profoundly worsen access for, for for the, the patients in our community, because as I outlined in my uh, note, the uh, contributions from Dignity per California law, which Tiffany misrepresented, which includes unpaid costs of government programs, Dignity's and Sutter's contributions have extended to their uh, entire network is close to $100 million. Uh, and is about 20% of their operating uh, expenses or revenues. And you're you're looking at a 2% target for Kaiser. And again, um, for Monica, Kaiser came in 2017 and uh, for supervisor, the, our supervisor Hernandez, there's 90,000 Medi-Cal patients. They did the right thing by Watsonville Hospital because they need that hospital in order to, to sell commercial insurance in this county. But they have zero Medi-Cal patients. Uh, um, six years into their their uh, journey in Santa Cruz County, they are focused on commercially insured patients where the profits are. They take no traditional Medicare patients. They heretofore have taken no Medi-Cal patients. And the most important thing I think that Super Supervisor Koenig was getting to is in-kind contributions and, and charity are nice, but they are dwarfed by the losses in the caring of Medicare and Medi-Cal patients. And that's for the $100 million that Dignity and Sutter are contributing to this community. And um, you are going to, the reason why, I see I'm at two minutes, happy to answer questions. The reason why this will destroy access is because Kaiser's target here, which is a sweetheart deal, coming before the renegotiated um, uh, uh, ATMC agreements, is um, it's one-tenth of what Dignity and Sutter are doing today. And you'll be sending a message to the physicians of Dignity and, and PAMF, stop taking Medi-Cal patients, stop seeing traditional Medicare patients, behave like Kaiser. Thank and you, Dr. Yigatali. Thank you, Dr. Yigatali. Is there anybody else on Zoom? 
Call in user three, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, thank you to the previous speakers, especially the doctor. We just heard saying that this will worsen access. That fact seems reason to vote this down. And as I was listening, I was thinking, yes, you've done a lot of work on this, but how convoluted our so-called healthcare system is <clears throat> and the insurance companies make off with all this money i feel like insurance companies should not be in the health care system at all i believe we have a right to health and a right to care of our choice like chiropractic acupuncture etc should be covered and recently I saw the film again called Sicko by Michael Moore. It was made over 10 years ago, but he showed how sick our healthcare system is. And maybe some of you saw it. It's worth seeing again because it shows there are other countries providing for health in uh, more ways to everyone than the United States. He went to Canada, England, I forget, uh, France, I think, where they have um, a health care system where people are treated. Cuba, whether they have money or not. And that's what we we need everybody to have access to genuine health care and not having the insurance companies in the picture and refusing care to people and raking in the profits. And this item on the agenda seems to just be giving more profits to Kaiser. I think it's worth voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else on Zoom? We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we have an additional speaker in chambers. Good morning, welcome. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. Joe Foster, Public Affairs Manager with Kaiser Permanente here in Santa Cruz County. Wanted to say thank you all for considering this item and wanted to reiterate and sort of piggyback on what uh, Chair Friend was saying about this being a starting point. And I think it's really important to point out, um, as was shown in the presentation, that there'll be aspects of this revisited, uh, mutually revisited by the county and Kaiser Permanente moving forward. We're, we're really happy to, you know, a number of years have gone into this, a lot of work uh, on staff's part. We certainly appreciate that. We mentioned earlier, or Tiffany mentioned earlier, uh, Valerie Lomax and Evelyn Tran from our team that worked on it. They're here with us today. Just wanted to recognize them for all their hard work. But, um, you know, we took this process very seriously, as did uh, county staff, and we're really happy to arrive at this point and look forward to the serving out the duration of this agreement and looking into ways to continue improving it as the ever-evolving local health care industry uh, continues to, to grow and change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Was there anybody else in chambers? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and propose, uh, make a motion that we approve the access to medical care agreement with Kaiser with an updated term, that's section five of the agreement, to expire upon the execution of new access to medical care agreements with Dominican, Sutter, and Watsonville. And that the new agreements for all healthcare providers include a definition of charity care that is consistent with state law by including unpaid cost of government sponsored healthcare programs and include reporting requirements in the new agreements on the total number of Medicare and Medi-Cal patients served. And that we also pursue access to medical care agreements with the physician medical groups. There's a motion, is there a second? I'll second that. Can I ask uh, counsel of what the mechanics of modifications to the contract would be? 
Yeah, the mechanics would be first, we'd have to talk to our contracting partner, Kaiser, to find out whether they were um, amenable to those changes. Because at this point, Kaiser has agreed to the, what's before the board. So if the board wants to make changes, then we'd be back in the negotiation phase. And so we would we would basically uh, take it back to Kaiser uh, to discuss these changes. And then we would bring it back at a later agenda for review. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I understand and appreciate that. And again, uh, as has been said, appreciate all the work that has been done both by county staff and by the Kaiser team on arriving at this agreement. And as has been said multiple times, this is a starting point. And I think uh, that really that's what I'm trying to encapsulate in my motion is that the term we will let's let's absolutely move forward with the, this agreement today. It's certainly better than not having an agreement. And um, but that we make it explicit that we're going to that this contract will expire and we'll reevaluate. Uh, and, you know, I, of course, we'd need a new contract ready to go uh, upon the time that we update our agreements with Dominican Sutter and Watsonville. And I feel like that's really the best way to make sure that we've created a level playing field here. Um, and of course, as was said, we're not required to update those agreements at any specific time. I certainly would be willing to give you an extension beyond uh, June of this year. I think it probably would push us into the time frame that's already encapsulated in this contract of 2024 or 2025. This contract that we have before us today says that the agreement would be reevaluated in 2025 Anyway, so I think just a more explicit link to that reevaluation happening at the time uh, that we look at uh, the all the access to care agreements in the county. So the board could the, the, the board could, if you if you wanted to give additional direction to staff to consider those items when it comes back with uh, another version of this contract later or amendments later. Um, is that is that making sense? That that's exactly right, and that's what it was explained in my motion. Is that this particular agreement? We would I'm moving that we adopt it today, with the exception of the change to the term. Yeah, but but then then you're not adopting the agreement because right. we're changing the term. That's the issue. So the question is, you either adopt as is and then provide additional direction, uh, which I'm all for all the additional direction. But we wouldn't be actually adopting the agreement because we'd be amending the agreement because the term is part of the contract. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. Okay, understood. I mean, of course, all the other points of the, the direction would be additional items to be considered in the future. Okay. Supervisor Arnett is concerned about this. You know, I think staff really spent, and probably the CAO's office, a tremendous amount of time with this agreement and to synchronize the contracts with three other um, uh, not agencies, but three other hospital systems is going to be even more time consuming to do it all at one time for staff. I don't know if they have the capacity to be able to negotiate three contracts and do their work four contracts, big, big major contracts at one time. I don't know if they have the capacity to do that because I'm sure this took them a good amount of time. The two offices, CAO's office and health to do this. So it kind of concerns me if they're going to be able to do it as well when they're they're staggered or synchronized to do all five of them or four of them, all the systems together in one big contract. Um, it just makes it difficult for them, I think. Are you supportive of the general concept of the additional data reporting and the need to ensure that we actually make sure that this agreement adds capacity on the Medi-Cal patients? Um, yes. I mean, I even wrote to, I wanted to see if we can make sure that we, if there's any changes to the agreement that are significant, uh, in state or federal funding formulas, or perhaps legislative or, uh, regulatory or policy changes that it come back to us, right. Where we can amend it, where we can amend it. Right. Um, to make it more, more, uh, fair in essence, but, I think putting it all on staff and one one lump sum to work on is kind of a big load, I think. No, I understand that. I mean, we can't unilaterally amend anything. Though. So the point, what we're trying, I think, to do is to create a system by which exactly what you're talking about, well, A, one, to get more information to make sure that it's serving the population that disproportionately is in our two districts, by the way. Number two, um, that if there are changes, as Mr. Foster said, this is an evolving system 
that there be flexibility and continued negotiation in advance of the 2024 and 2025 and time frame. Justin brought up that there is that mechanism, but it goes to the director. But I think that he also alluded that it can come back to us. Uh, if he was asking if it can come back to us, I don't think it was answered, but we can we can say it can come back to us if it's if it's a significant significant uh, change that's happening in the contract. Okay, I mean, so I think the mechanism is the annual report to allow for that opportunity is what I'm saying. We're getting a yearly check in, right, right? But we can't unilaterally amend is what I'm saying. This is an agreement between two parties. I mean, it's a standard contract. Um, but we can telegraph the expectations of what it should say, right? And that's what I think that we're trying to come to an agreement here. Uh, Supervisor Cummings? Yeah, I just want to, <clears throat> so to Felipe's point and to what I was bringing up earlier, you know, within the language, it says, um, you know, authorize the health services agency director or designate to sign the agreement and any future amendments as approved by county council. And I think there, you know, if it's non-substantive uh, amendments, then, you know, having the health services director do that, I think makes sense. But, you know, given that this is new, if it's a substantial change that's going to occur, having that come back to the board would make sense. And that's why I was asking how many times we've we seen substantial changes to these uh, agreements occur in the past, you know, being new to this, I'm not sure, but it seems like that might help us get to, you know, um, really understanding if there's major changes rather than just that being a black box for us having yes. the authority to be able to make those changes. But I did want to also say that um, just given the uh, extent of the, the amendments, it's hard for me to really be able to understand exactly what we're doing without seeing that in front of us. I think minor changes to the direction is one thing, but then, you know, if, if there's a way for us to be able to kind of lay this out, um, because I really want to try to understand what Supervisor Koenig is proposing. And I know that some of it incorporates being able to get updates on whether or not this is effective, but what was stated was really hard for me to just kind of internalize as it was being said, because there was a lot of proposals to that amendment. Um, but, um, similar to what the county council was saying, and and um, I'm not sure what direction we can go. But if today we're making this, we're we're adopting this contract, being able knowing that if there's any major amendments that come, that it will come before the board, and then we can have some of these other pieces considered over time as we're making these other agreements. That sounds like something that we can probably move ahead with. But I think for me, also those other. Um, uh, recommendations are something that I really want to better understand because they came really quickly. It seemed like they were major changes and I'd like to better understand what we're, what's being proposed. And so, you know, for me initially, I was thinking, you know, I, I see a lot of changes in the system for behavioral health. I don't know if you've seen the letter that came out from the governor about housing and behavioral health that's coming out, but that's what I was thinking about. But Manu made me think about, you know, Medi-Cal funding, you know, and changes that might come up in that. But I think that the yearly update, I think that's because it's going to come in a policy, um, the yearly cycle for the policy changes that come up federal with the federal government and the state government. So we can align those amendments with that that come up every year and we can make those changes as they come every year. And that'll be the updates that that we will begin now. This is the start point, and every year we can update it and make it better every year when there's changes that change the, the agreement, right? If there's changes that are significant. So let me let me, let me just try here for a second, if I may, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's unit, and we should get to unanimity on this, by the way, this really matters. I mean, so right. I think that there is unanimity that we move forward today with the access to medical care agreement. I think that that's established and we'll have to make sure that's clear in the motion. I think that there should be unanimity on the fact that any uh, substantive amendments come back to the Board of Supervisors. I think that that's understood. Where we're just now looking for unanimity is ensuring that we have an understanding of what the additional amendments are of additional information and guidance to staff when they're in renegotiation as to what we would like them to prioritize. I think that's really what this is. And I think that we're actually, actually what I hear is we're actually exceptionally close. There just has to be an understanding of what that is. So if you don't mind sure. restating that when also with sort of that framework, and then I will. I, we'll, I, I agree with your, your comments. This is a complicated issue. Uh, healthcare issues always are. And this, uh, this is a 10 year agreement. Is that. So uh, the, the 10 year um, I, agreement you know, with coming back on uh, 2025 to revisit. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, I just, I think we're, this is unusual and it's a step in the right direction. Uh, so I, I would um, go with the, the basic staff recommendation with the addition with what supervisor, what chair friend said um, that we, we can review it, but I don't want, I, I made the second um, and I think, I don't know, I'll hear from supervisor Koenig, but I'd be uh, willing to withdraw that and, and follow with the direction of what the supervisor or chair friend said. Well, it's possible that we may be there anyway. Go ahead, supervisor Koenig. I, I guess I want to start because we're bantering around this idea of revision, right? So, I mean, the current contract, I see in there that we agree to reevaluate in 2025, but there's no requirement to do so, right? I mean, there's no requirement that Kaiser ever accept any of our proposed revisions, right? Until the agreement ultimately ends in 10 years from now. So I'm reading that wrong. If the board wants to make changes, we we would launch into that discussion with Kaiser. If the board is not satisfied with the changes, obviously the contract, we can modify it at that point or, you know, come back to legal counsel to figure out the best way to move forward with. Right, so we can propose changes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Will be accepted. And, and Kaiser will have to. We will have to renegotiate with Kaiser on those changes. Yeah, right. It's a continuing conversation on what community benefit looks like. Right. I. I, I mean, I guess that's the only guarantee we have. Right. Yeah, and if we come to if we come to a place where we disagree at some point on what community benefit looks like, then we look at what our remedies are. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't love that but uh, <laughs> but it might be the best that uh we can do today um so let me explain the other parts of what i'm talking about here um which really get is the suggestion that all new agreements for access to health care to, to medical care uh, include a definition of charity care that considers uncompensated costs associated with government-sponsored Medicare and Medicare, or Me Medicare and Medi-Cal healthcare programs. So again, this gets back to the example. Someone goes to, let's say, it's the Watsonville emergency room, and they have $100,000 worth of care provided to them. That's the cost to the hospital. Unfortunately, we haven't seen Medi-Cal keep up with the the cost of care. And so the hospital may only get $30,000 back. So now they have a $70,000 loss, but our current access to medical care agreements, they were written in 1993, back when that gap between what the government sponsored insurance was paying and the cost of care was not as big. This was not a big issue back then. And so, um, but today it is, and we're not even, we're not even really accounting for it in our agreements. And so, I mean, when we hear that Sutter is providing $2 million a year in charity care, that's not considering that gap between when, whenever they help Medicare and Medi-Cal patients between what they're getting paid and the cost of service. And so I think it's important if we're going to actually look at who is providing what to uh, people in our community that we make sure we do some accounting of that. And that, that's actually state law now. I mean, as you heard, these healthcare providers are providing those statistics to the state. They're just not providing them to us because the state's law was updated in 2019. Our contract agreements are from 1993. So all I'm asking for is that in the future, when we consider new access to care agreements with all the healthcare providers in our community, that we make sure we have reporting on that. Additional data collection. I mean, it's not right. Different reporting to us than they do to the state. Is that what? <laughs> That's my understanding. Yes. I'm just wondering if maybe county council and county staff can weigh in on this just a little bit because I'd like to just better understand. I mean, I, I I think I hear what Supervisor Koenig is saying, which is that um, we clearly identify charity care in our agreements, and then we try to determine what services are being provided by that care. And then when there's uncompensation for services that we understand what that number is, I, if I'm getting that correctly, so maybe I'm not. I know this is, um, I know that the world right now with health is so complicated and there's so many needs. 
And we are in a situation where all of us are struggling to recruit, including these health systems. Um, specialty care just seems to just be eroding every day in our community. And I want to acknowledge that and also acknowledge that the request you're making is actually very different in many ways. And it, it does tie to the current agreements you have with these hospitals. It sounds to me like you want to understand a little bit more as what are some of the gaps that our um, indigent communities are experiencing in care? Um, what do they look like? What are we not accounted for? And that obviously is information we can capture for you. And then there's an agreement that we have with health systems that you are trying to ensure that our population has access to care. As insurance continues to grow, whether through Medi-Cal, as we know, and now in California, we're even insuring those who are undocumented. This will continue to be an issue in our community, but not as broad. Um, so I wanna separate the, the issues that we're confronting as a system, as a community, with the agreement that you have here, and also remind you that what you're requesting makes a lot of sense. And um, 40, 50 years ago, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. So I encourage to, to adopt the recommendation we're proposing and then set a new recommendation for us to do the separate research that you're looking for, and then come back and assess as we're reporting to you on these agreements annually. And we're coming to you to also have you approve the new contracts, whether or not it makes sense after you've seen the data that you're requesting, because it is separate and I know it goes together. Um, so I'll pause there and see if Council or, or Tiffany want to add anything else. I don't have a further recommendation, but I can extrapolate a bit on the example that um, that first district supervisor Koenig brought up if you want me to. Okay, so in the example where there's a $100,000 cost for a service in the emergency department, and let's say Medi-Cal or Medicare only reimburses 30, you said 30,000, so 30%, 30 and there's this 70% gap. Stuff like that does exist. Um, it is reported to the state, but the difference is what the hospitals report to the state, um, and Kaiser doesn't have to report this in Santa Cruz County because they don't have a hospital here. So what the hospitals re report to the state, there isn't like a, a clear definition of what that ceiling of $100,000 is. So the hospital says, well, this service costs $100,000. It's essentially their charge master price what we've tried to do in the agreement that's before you today on Kaiser is actually put a ceiling on that. So it wouldn't be 100,000. It would be what Medicare reimburses plus 20%, which we feel is um, more accurate of what the true costs are. So we're starting to get to what you're describing. And I think the the further direction will, will help us get there on a future reporting. Yeah, and I, I wanna appreciate that you included that element in the agreement with Kaiser to try to get at the true cost of care. Supervisor Cummings. I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of moving forward, because it sounds like, I mean, I think this is, especially as a new supervisor, something that I would like to maybe have more background on in terms of, um, you know, where we're going with these other contracts. And so I'm wondering, based on the feedback that you've received, if there's an opportunity for us to have this come back, the, the second part of this come back is another item that we can dive more deeply into and that the public can have a better understanding of because it sounds like the contract, the, the second round of contracts, the contracts with Dominican and um, PAMP, or actually maybe I should ask this as a question, when are those, when are we expected to see those contracts? We were just discussing that. So they will have to come to your board. It's one of the directives you provided to us. Um, depending on the motion that goes, um, uh, we can, uh, the goal is for us to start those contract negotiations now. Um, I heard a little bit of motion of potentially coming back in 2025. So it really does depend on, um, you know, when the board wants us to come back. I, I will ask that if you please can give us a few months uh, because it does take some time, um, depending if you separate these uh, agreements would be ideal or if you're going to lump them together as uh, Supervisor Hernandez had mentioned, it would be a little bit more complicated. So for us, as soon as this is agreed upon, we'll go back to the other health systems, start negotiations. But as you notice, it definitely can take months to years to get to something that is agreeable. We will walk the board through the process along the way, having you know one-on-ones with you, giving you updates, and then coming to you for final approval um, once we have some form of draft agreement. Let me just say that 
I think that we're fine with the recommended action with that by modification of when something comes back to the board. Where there's inadequacy is on the annual reporting, quite frankly. Um, so if you want that outside of this agreement, I totally respect it. This is also the time for us to make that direction to you, though. So that's why we're having this discussion. So I think that um, the fundamental question will need to be asked whether this improves access to care for low-income patients in our community period, and the annual report doesn't actually do that. And so what I think what we're trying to do is get information back um, in that annual reporting situation. And if you feel that it should occur outside of the Kaiser annual report, and it should just be a, a yearly access to care report, that's fine too, because we can provide direction at that time, writ large to the Kaiser agreement, as well as the other agreements. But I think that there's an, a lack of satisfaction from the board about, the, or where there's a concern that the agreement as written may not change the trajectory of access to care for indigent care patients in our community, period. And we want to make sure it does. That's the point of what we're here to do. And I think that so too to those that are actually engaging in the agreement, which is why we heard a commitment publicly from the organization to be willing to make this an iterative and baseline process. And so what we're looking for is just to try and come to a motion <laughs> that does exactly that. And what I would recommend is a motion that that adopts the recommended action with that modification of substantive changes coming back to the board. And I think that you've heard some of the requests of what we want in a robust annual reporting process. And if we can, if you need it enumerated, we can enumerate it. If you feel like you could repeat back to us some of the things you've heard and we can consider that satisfactory, we can also go down that road. I mean, I'll leave it to the board member. Um, but we still have a motion and a second on the floor that we need to actually address. Either we need to vote on this specific thing or it needs to be withdrawn or modified at this point because we're getting to that sort of that point. But I think that's that's where we are. Supervisor Koenig? Sure. So I, I think as uh, Director Morales pointed out, we have this sort of June 2023 date for renegotiating the existing access to care, medical care agreements with the other three major providers. Now, whether or not we actually, I mean, and that's a board directive. So we're probably, especially if there's substantive changes recommended to those agreements, we're probably going to have to push that date out. Um, now, I think when that request comes, it could be an opportunity to look again at the situation as requested by Supervisor Cummings. Um, so, yeah, but at the same time, it's helpful. I, I feel it's helpful to have the, you know, in our motion today, this direction of what it is that we're looking for ultimately in some of those new agreements and also in, in terms of uh, reporting requirements. Okay, I, I think this can, we can simplify this if we take the direction of staff plus uh, an annual access to care report, uh, with, where more issues will come up. I mean, it'll simplify the motion, I think, uh, and that's what I'd be supportive of as well. I'm happy to modify, suggest a modified motion. Why don't you just withdraw the previous one? Okay, I'll, I'll, with, I'll withdraw the previous okay. motion. All right, and then go ahead and start again. Okay, I will suggest, I will move that we approve the access to medical care agreement or with Kaiser. And that the new that we pursue uh, new agreements with Dominican Center and Watsonville, and that those new agreements include a definition of charity care that is consistent with state law by including unpaid cost of government sponsored health care programs, and that we they include annual reporting requirements in the uh, on the total number of Medicare and Medi-Cal patients served. I'll second that. Okay, so let me just throw something in here which is just that I believe that there was a desire by the board to ensure that any substantive agreements in this recommended action come back to the board of supervisors and not that we're not delegating the authority. So that's just a modification of that recommended action. Yes, that's amenable. And, that's what you asked for. Yeah, please, supervisor. And that asked. report comes with the annual report, you're saying? The report with the other, other um, systems? Yes. Okay. Questions? Everybody in agreement? Yep. Is the clerk in agreement or understanding, I should say? Yes, I believe we understand. Thank you. If you're in agreement, too, you can let us know. Um, Thank you. We good? All right, but well then we'll, if you could do a roll call vote, please. Okay. And to clarify, I have this motion coming from Supervisor Koenig, seconded by Supervisor McPherson. Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. 
Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. Uh, Chair Friend, if I could just comment, uh, thank you for your vote. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate the board on um, taking the access to care medical agreements uh, so seriously and having this um, precedent set because uh, my understanding is pretty clear that we're the only county in the state that does these agreements. And this is the only first time that Kaiser has ever signed an agreement like this with anyone in the state. And I know the agreement's not perfect. As you said, we're coming back, we're gonna make them better, but it is an achievement. And a, uh, I think it is a precedent that this board has set in trying to increase medical care um, for the most needy in our community. So I think, I know there's, it's often not clear to get the, the context, and the context is that your board is showing leadership on this issue statewide. And I want to make sure that you understand that it's not a perfect agreement. We agree. Uh, the staff has done a great job in negotiating it, uh, but it's also a leadership position that you are taking statewide on this very issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. We have a 1045 scheduled item that we're going to move to right now, which is item 12, which is the Board of Supervisors shall recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7 to convene and carry out a regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you need, I don't think there's anybody additional from the, is there? Everyone will be attending in person that I'm aware of. Okay. They just go through that plan. Okay. All right, if we could uh, have a roll call, please. Supervisor Hernandez is here. He's just stepping out for a second. Go ahead. Certainly. Supervisor, um, apologies, Director Koenig. Here. Cummings. Here. Friend. Here. McPherson. Here. Colbertson. Bilicic. Clark. Present. And noting that Supervisor Hernandez, Director Hernandez is returning to us shortly. I'll make sure that we include that information when he returns. Okay. I had also received information, maybe Mr. Machado or Ms. Fatui would know. I think that Ms. Bilicic, hasn't there been a change in the city of Watsonville for that representative? Yeah. So I think it's Vanessa now, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Okay. So, uh, but I don't see Vanessa here either. So we'll count it that way. All right. So we'll move on to... Uh, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, no changes today, Chair. Thank All right, you. so we'll open it up for oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items not on today's agenda, but within the purview of Zone 7. Any member of the community would like to address us in oral communications? <laughs> okay, we'll close oral communications. We'll move on to item four, which is approval of the Zone 7 board meeting minutes. Are there any changes to the minutes from directors? Seeing none, any member of the community would like to address us on the minutes? All right, bring back to the board for action. Move approval of the minutes. Second. We have a motion from Director Koenig, a second from Director um, McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Cummings. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Friend. Aye. That passes. We'll move on to action on the consent agenda. These are items six through eight. Are there any questions on any of the items on consent? Any member of the community would like to address us on consent? Bring it back to the board for action. Want to make a motion? I make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. Yeah, perfect. Second. All right. We have a motion from Director Clark, a second from Director McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Friend? Aye. And Clark? Aye. Welcome, by the way. Um, we'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is item nine, which is to consider nominations for the election of the Zone 7 Board of Directors, Chairperson and Vice Chairperson, as outlined in the memo of the District Engineer. Uh, Ms. Fatui? Thank you. Yes, this item is in front of you to nominate Chairperson and Vice I think the microphone uh, button. There you go. <laughs> Yes, this item is in front of you to nominate the chair and vice chair for the Zone 7 board. And if if, uh, if possible, we'd like to add some uh, history uh, to consider while calling for the nomination, which is the ongoing transfer of the Pajaro River Flood Control Management Project responsibility from Zone 7 to the newly formed Pajaro River Flood Management Agency. And uh, having the current chair keep that role will help in the smooth transitioning of the process and achieving 
the project's impl implementation goals. Therefore, Zone 7 staff is recommending that the incumbent chair be nominated for another term. Staff also is recommending for the vice chair be filled by yeah. the board of city of that was involved representative. All right, are there any questions from board members on this? Any member of the community would like to address this on item nine? I'll bring it back to the board for action. So move recommended action. A second. Great. We have a motion from Director McPherson, a second from Dr. Clark. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Clark? Aye. Friend? Aye. And Director Hernandez, who has yeah. joined us at 1113. All right, that passes unanimously. We'll move on to item 10, approve the amendment to the 2023 Zone 7 Board of Directors meeting schedule, replacing the May 30th, 2023 meeting with a May 9th, 2023 meeting as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. This is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, is there any director that has any question on this item? Any member of the community would like to address us on this item? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for a motion. I'm so sorry, Chair. Oh, yes. We do have someone online who would like to speak. Okay, I apologize for that. Dr. Bilicic, your microphone's now available. Thank you. Um, good evening. I good, good morning. I just wanted to ask you about the May 9th budget meeting uh, at 1045. Isn't that usually in Watsonville? It's going to be held in here. That was decided and discussed before. It's going to be held in this chamber. But there still is a meeting in Watsonville, correct? I believe in, in October. In October, yes. Yeah. I thought we had it two and two, two in Santa Cruz and two in Watsonville. I think we've had both director, or sorry, uh, Dr. Bilicic, uh historically, and then this is proposing a change to have that move to Santa Cruz. Well, it certainly is up to you. Um, but I, I noticed that there were two usually for Santa Cruz and two for Watsonville, and the budget one was had been in Watsonville. So just a consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Bilicic, I apologize that I didn't go to Zoom initially. Did you have any oral communications that you wanted to make? Because that was my mistake to not open that up. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so bring it back to the board now for action on item 10. Did we have a motion and a second on that? Move approval. Second. All right, we have a motion from Director Koenig and a second from... Yeah. Uh, from Director Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Certainly. Director Clark? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And the last item on our regular agenda for Zone 7 is to adopt a resolution confirming benefit assessment rates for the 2023-24 fiscal year to adopt a resolution setting hearing on May 9th, 2023, beginning at 10.45 a.m. or thereafter. To consider the 23-24 benefit assessment rate report and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the district engineer, we have the, the resolution adopting benefit assessment, the resolution setting the public hearing, and the notice of public hearing. If we could have a report, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair and Directors. Matt Machado, your district engineer. And so just uh, briefly, I want to cover that this is an item that we bring back to you annually. Um, our staff computes this benefit assessment rates. Uh, this year's assessment rate is, is simply increased by uh, a CPI, but the CPI is uh, at a maximum 4% due to uh, the way our district was established uh, back from the 91 uh, district engineers report. And so the recommended action today is to include a CPI um, uh, limited to 4%. And uh, your chair already uh, listed the recommended actions. And so staff is here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members? Any member of the community would like to address us on this item in chambers? A member of the community on Zoom? Yes. Dr. Billisich, your microphone's now available. Thank you. Um, is this the standard zone seven that's on the tax bill? Is that what the assessment that we're talking about? Yes, it is. So it's nothing to do with the individual assessments that people are already paying. That's correct. That's a different, if you're referring to the assessment that was approved, that was through a different agency. This is, agency? The, yeah, this is the zone seven, not the PERFMA uh, vote. It. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anybody else on Zoom? No further speakers, Chair. We'll bring it back to the board for a, a motion. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion from Director Hernandez for the recommended actions, a second by Director Cummings. We could have a roll call, please. Of course, Director Clark. Aye. 
McPherson? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you. Noting that Director Koenig has stepped away. Thank you. And thank you, Council, for sitting in on this. That will close our Zone 7 meeting. Thank you for coming up, by the way, for this. We truly appreciate it. And we will move back to the regular Board of Supervisors meeting, which is item 8. Item 8 is to consider a report on purpose, scope, and financial details of the Boulder Creek Water Quality and Recovery Project as currently proposed and direct staff to return on or before October 17th, 2023 with a continued status report, implementation strategy, and further budget details. As outlined in the memo of the Director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, we have the agenda item board memo as well as two different attachments. And I believe our primary presenter is uh, Mr. Reed, David Reed, who's the director of OR3. Mr. Reed, welcome back. We appreciate your work recently with all the storms as well. Thank you, Chair, Board, um, for the opportunity to bring you all up to speed on uh, this interesting uh, in opportunity to build resilience in our community, what we call the Boulder Creek Water Quality and Recovery Project. Okay. Just quickly on an agenda um, in the in the meeting purpose, really, as I said, to bring you all up to speed on this project, but more importantly, um, for the board and the public to better understand how these types of resiliency projects um, need to be framed in our community, need to be understood uh, in the changing climate that we live in, uh, so that we can better position ourselves to address the needs and concerns of our community, both urban and rural. So we'll be doing a quick dive into the, the history of the project and the San Lorenzo Valley sewering, um, and then go over the preliminary project goals, scope, cost funding, and discuss next steps. So the history of, of sewering in the Valley is long standing, um, and I won't go into it in great detail, but I do wanna say that the San Lorenzo Valley watershed supplies water for over 95,000 folks in our community. And during the late 70s, early 80s, um, the, the maintenance of those septic systems, those on-site water treatment systems, OTS, um, caused significant degradation of the water quality in the valley. At one time, the regional board put a moratorium on new development in the valley. And out of that process was the first attempt to sewer um, or install sewer in the valley. This newspaper clip from 1984 indicates that that initiative failed um, for a host of reasons. The main one being the fear of growth inducing um, development because of sewering. So I just wanna set that as the context as we move through this, um, that it failed in, in, in the early 80s because of a fear of more development. Um, there are still a tremendous number of on-site water treatment systems in the Valley. Many of them predate code. Many of them have issues that are now addressed in the newly adopted LAMP that you've all been um, aware of. Um, in Boulder Creek specifically, um, big development in the 1960s um, around the Boulder Creek Golf and Country Club created CSA 7, which is a sanitation district serving the residents up there around 250 or so connections. Um, another subdivision in the set in the late 60s um, created Fallen Leaf neighborhood, which is Big Basin Sewer, um, which is another uh, small sanitation district in the valley currently experiencing issues. In the early 90s, and uh, there were two attempts to explore sewering again in the valley. Those attempts um, also did not see uh, success in moving forward. So. Where we are today um, is in large part due to the impacts um, from the CZU fire on our community, where in addition to the 911 homes that were lost during that fire, approximately 75 of those homes were along the Highway 236 corridor in, in and around Mulder Creek in areas that have historically high groundwater levels and challenging on-site treatment systems, which likely would require expensive enhanced treatment systems to meet current LAMP standards. So as part of the board's direction in working with environmental health, there was a five-year grace period identified for those property owners rebuilding, where if we could move a project, a sewering project forward, um, not completion, but move it forward with a vote that it was gonna be moving forward successfully, those folks rebuilding would not be subject to enhanced treatment standards if 
their lot was requiring it and that they could wait out to the installation of that pro, uh, of that new sewer system. So that <coughs> fire um, created this unique opportunity to re-explore the Boulder Creek Water Quality and Recovery Project and to address um, some long-standing issues and some near-term issues. So what this project brings to bear is, is what we call, what we have is four major pillars um, the first being environmental protection. As we said, the water treatment systems in the valley, aged um, and unregulated, have contributed to high nitrate concentrations, impaired water body stat statuses for the San Lorenzo Valley. This type of a project would hopefully improve water quality, surface water quality in the San Lorenzo Valley. It has the opportunity to provide recycled water that could also be used by the golf course. Currently, the golf course is watering its nine holes that are operating as a golf course with potable water in a community where we don't have a straw anywhere else in the state for water. Um, it's a big deal to have um, potable water being used on golf courses. Obviously, in, in Pasa Tiempo as an example, in the past, we changed that um, to being recycled water from Scotts Valley. The other piece, as I said, disaster recovery, trying to reduce those costs to rebuild. Climate change resilience is really the piece that I want to highlight where this opportunity gives us another recycled water source in our county with Pure Water SoCal coming online in the next year or so. We need to continue to look at and explore opportunities to develop recycled water sources um, throughout the county. So we have that already in Watsonville. We have a recycled water plant in Scotts Valley. This new one will be coming online in Soquel, and this is another opportunity to provide recycled water from a myriad of opportunities and uses, not the least of which is potentially recharge opportunities in the watershed, as well as fire suppression storage. So if we have a large water tank of recycled water, we could be using that for wildfire suppression. The other interesting thing that has come out of the fire is that Big Basin State Park, the largest and oldest, not largest, the oldest state park in the state, um, is reorganized its entry um, its main headquarters now is just up the road in 236. So Boulder Creek becomes the gateway to that state park in the future, hopefully return of the 2 million visitors annually. So the economic vibrancy of Boulder Creek would be tremendously imp improved by getting those, those businesses onto sewer systems rather than the Holloway program that they're currently on. Um, so what does this project look like? Um, this is a map that has a number of color-coded communities that have been identified through the feasibility study. The pink, um, granted this is a little blurry, the pink up in the upper left is the existing golf course. And then there are these discrete neighborhood um, elements that would be considered as part of the expansion of this project. Um, to include the two blue sections, which would be kind of the downtown Boulder Creek area and some of the corridor down Highway 9. In addition, there's a purple section. That's um, Boulder Creek Estates. It's, again, another sanitation district currently operated by San Lorenzo Valley Water that is requesting inclusion in the project as well. So obviously, this would be a potential build out, but obviously, there's lots of, of steps that need to come, need to, need to be addressed before we can settle on a full scope. But this is the pr proposed scope to date. So as I said, that scope includes over 1,200 new connections, um, 900 of those being residential, 300 plus being commercial. Um, and obviously, this could be a phased project or scaled depending on community support, funding, and uh, various other circumstances. So quickly and briefly, just touching on the benefits of this project, as I discussed from a public standpoint, um, there's the environmental protection, the climate change resilience, economic vibrancy. But there's also benefits to um, property owners and business owners. So as I said, in recovery, um, those folks that are rebuilding may be faced with enhanced treatment systems um, requirements by, based on the LAMP. Um, that range, seventy dollars to $100,000, um, is significant upfront cost that they would have to bear in either the rebuild process or if they're remodeling and subject to new standards. Um, Additionally, by being on sewer, they have the ability, property owners would have the ability to add a bedroom or an ADU without the complex redesign of their septic systems. 
Um, there's also obviously fire suppression resources that would help hopefully help improve insurance cir circumstances there. And then obviously the economic resources. If downtown Boulder Creek expands and improves its commercial opportunities for community, that ideally hopefully reduces the vehicle miles travel that folks have to get to, to travel to get good services or other things that they may need. So the cost elements that I'll present to you cover the capital costs, some annual maintenance and operation costs, and the one-time site improvements that may be required on an individual basis. That cost estimate right now is a range of 60 to $90 million, significant amount of money. And obviously, inflation and cost of construction is a risk that that number could go up. And obviously, depending on the project scope, that project, the cost could go up or down depending on phasing. We've already um, applied for grants, um, and I just want to highlight and appreciate um, Katie Beach and Ashley Trujillo and Aaron McCarthy, McCarthy and Sierra Ryan. We have submitted, your board approved, submitted a grant um, through the Clean Water State Revolving Fund to begin this project, and they did a, a tremendous amount of work to get that forward, but there are more grant opportunities that we need to explore to try and lower those costs. So. To break down those costs, that 60 to $90 million, um, if the property owners and the connections were to pay the full cost of that estimate, um, it's between forty-seven dollars and $70,000 of connection. And if you amortize that over perhaps a 30-year time period, it's around that $1,500 to $2,500 a year cost. And that's if all properties are treated equally. We know that for something like this, you need to have an engineering report and there's a cost benefit analysis or there's a, a benefit analysis done. So we would likely see a different cost structure for commercial businesses versus residential businesses. And then you would have maintenance and operation costs in, in that range of $1,500 to $2,000 a year. And the one-time site improvements really vary depending on the conditions of the, of the property, um, but in that 7 to 10K range. So annually you're looking at about $250 to $375 a month potentially for this. So it's it's not insignificant. But I think the important thing that I want to bring up in the context of resilience is some of the other expensive resiliency projects that are going on throughout the county and put this in context. So we know that the Pajaro Levy system is a resiliency project, a $400 million project that um, is ideally is, is fully funded by the government. We have the Pure Water Soquel project, which is a $195 million project, of which $95 million of that is grant funded. And then we've done other things in the county, as was referenced earlier by Supervisor McPherson. 3CE essentially is a resiliency project, which took a tremendous amount of effort. So these kinds of projects are not free. They're challenging and complicated. And what we need to do now is move forward and try and find community support to move this latest attempt at sewering in the valley forward. And fortunately, we, we've we started with a $2 million EPA grant earmark from Anna Eshoo's office before she departed. Um, as a, one of our representatives, she earmarked $2 million. So we have $2 million coming into the county um, to, to move this project forward. And what we're going to try and do in that first, in that first uh, funding is to, is to do community outreach and education to solidify community support on a scope. We're gonna do the things around an engineering report that would help define the finances of it. Um, and then obviously continue trying to find grant funding and grant opportunities and further the design permitting and property acquisition to get a finer uh, pencil to those estimates. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions you may have. Thank you for that detailed presentation. Also, thank you, Supervisor McPherson, for all your leadership on this. I don't know. I appreciate yeah. that you've been a steadfast leader. Supervisor McPherson. This has been a, a this is a big deal in San Lorenzo Valley, in particular Boulder Creek, of course, and uh, it's a very costly one as well. And I want to begin by thanking the county uh, past and present because it's been a years long effort. Uh, we've worked to bring uh, this concept back to life on for the people and businesses in Boulder Creek area. It's, it's taken a lot of work to get to this point, uh, even before the CZU fires. Um, and it uh, gave us a renewed sense of what we need to do to address the longstanding problem of the overdrafted uh, septic systems in Boulder Creek. Uh, by some measures, the most concentrated area of uh, septics west of the Mississippi. 
in my uh, that I've heard. Uh, this is especially important to give the new state standards that we have on advanced septic system, which as a report highlights could be very costly themselves for fire survivors and others when they rebuild or expand their homes. I think it's important to recognize that this project has received uh, support Valley wide, Boulder Creek area wide from the Valley Women's Club Environmental Committee, the Boulder Creek Business Association and the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, some of whom were adamantly opposed. And I remember that 1984 articles uh, that were uh, written in the 80s in the Sentinel. But in but as mentioned, it's this has already received a two million dollar grant. I had ASU who was drawn out of the uh, Santa Cruz County in the redistricting. But I can assure you that uh, Congressman Jimmy Panetta is fully aware of the importance of this and the, the long time we've tried to uh, get this funding started and uh, how we identify uh, how we can provide a local match as well. Um, the ultimate objective, of course, is to fully fund the project and win a, a broad base of community support, which is mentioned in, in the plan of the $2 million grant that we've received to bring these properties into the county service area seven. Um, I also especially want to thank our partner, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, um, for all the great work they've, they do for the community. And I'm glad this proposal addresses the longstanding need to extend uh, to Bear, Bear Creek Estates. Our state and federal uh, legislative delegation or delegations uh, is also in support of this project. And our goal is to win as much state and federal grant. It is very costly, as was mentioned. Um, the economic fire safety, uh, environmental as recovery aspects uh, make this a very attractive project, very expensive, but very attractive. Uh, this will really be important for the San Juan's Valley and the Boulder Creek area in particular, um, for the, the public safety, for uh, environmental uh, protection. Uh, I thank you for all the work that you have done. Uh, we're at the starting line, but uh, the gun has gone off and we're going to start running to uh, get sufficient federal and state grants, which I think we have a very excellent chance under the circumstances to get uh, additional funding from federal and state sources. So thank you very much, Mr. Reed, and uh, everybody who has been associated with trying to get, get to uh, getting us where we are and uh, hopefully for a successful project. In the near future, and I don't know what near means in this uh, in that regard, but thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I just want to thank you all for that presentation um, and for the work on trying to get the you know, water systems and the Um Is that better? There we go. Um, so the one question I had: um, you had the twelve hundred eighty-five new connections number. Is that new? residential properties that could be developed or are these people who are for example on septic that would then be connected into the sewer system um i'll just start there i guess yeah that that number is based on the existing developed properties that are on sewer in those in those areas i'm just curious if there's any potential for properties that can't be developed on currently that may be able to be developable when these new this new system would be in place if you have any thoughts on that your board as the land use and regulatory authority has the one acre minimum currently countywide. So it would be at your discretion whether you wanted to explore changing that. So currently properties that are less than one acre in the valley and throughout the county are not allowed um, to develop. And that's because of the septic requirements. So your board would have the, uh, you know, the discretion to explore how you want to do that currently. The project does not envision adding that capacity to those undebuildable lots because of the the notion that we we do as a community want to try and put people in our urban core, which is generally safer um, from natural disasters like wildfires that were subject to this area. So the environmental community is in support of this project in part because the intent is not to expand significantly the development capacity in this project scope. Got it. And then um just a follow-up question on um, what's a sense of timeline around this project? I mean, I think there's some um, discussion about the potential for this to help with people who are trying to rebuild from fire. But, you know, if people are trying to rebuild and it's going to take 10 years for us to get the system up and running, you know, do they make these investments 
early on in septic with the, the hope that later on they can connect. So I'm just kind of curious if you can speak to a little bit to the timeline and next steps. Yeah, I don't know if, if um, Assistant Director um, Edler would, would like to talk on project timeline. I will briefly to say that the, the five-year grace period was, was if we're making measurable progress, that would be extended. So it's not like the project has to be in the ground, but I, I don't know if, if you want to briefly. Sure. Uh, good morning. Ken Tedler, Assistant Director with CDI. Um, the time frame is, that we have built out on this is about 10 to 11 years. I mean, that includes everything from community outreach, forming assess assessment districts, going through the LAPCO process, all the environmental work, design. Um, it's, a, it's a big lift, and a lot of that does depend on funding. Um, right now, you know, it's a, you know, approximately, you know, could be up to a $90 million project, um, of which we have 2 million right now to you know, start the, the planning process. Um, but even the planning process alone is going to be quite a bit more than just the, the $2 million. So hopefully that answers your question. Yep. Any other, um, Supervisor Connick? Thanks for your work on this exciting project. It's an opportunity where we've identified a, a public project that will ultimately make everyone in the area better off than if they were operating individually. So that's commendable. Uh, question about the recycled water. So, um, I mean, is it would it be treated to the same standards as, for example, pure water SoCal? And then you mentioned that injection into the groundwater act for was a possibility but what i got from reading the report was it's more likely to be um, released back into the creek itself to provide for fish flows is that accurate yeah i mean i think i think it's early to it's it's early in the process to know both what level of treatment would be funded right because to get to the pure water soquel level costs a lot of money um and so i think that's my hope is that is that we can find the funding support to get to a place where um where it's as useful a water source as possible for as many different options and whether that's injection or reintroduction into the surface water we know regulations around recycled water continue to evolve continue to evolve and change so 10 years from now or seven years from now there may be different opportunities to you and how that recycled water is used potentially toilet to tap type stuff, um, but we're not there yet. So, um, lot lots more to work on if that's if that's amenable and an answer. Okay, thank you. I'd like to open it up for the community. Is there any member of the community that'd like to address this on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, so I want to confirm that this project would be an expansion of the existing CSA 7 with extraterritorial um, or annexations into CSA 7. Have you uh, contacted LAFCO to see what that process would look like and what the expense would be for that? Or would this be a special benefit assessment district that is a completely different animal and uses uh, an engineering report and uh, puts out uh, to ballot special benefit assessments that are calculated for each parcel's special benefit um, uh, amount. Um, I I want to point out you you talked about recycled water efforts in the county already. Um, there's there's one in Davenport that you did not mention, and that is a county recycled water facility that the county built and actually is not even being used. The agricultural users there are not using it. So let's put that to use and um, please include that in your reports in the future. I would like to know what uh, environmental health has on record for the number of septic system complaints and failures in the San Lorenzo Valley. I know this winter has been a tough one for those with septic systems, but I think that level of information is also important to have. I think that uh, it's important to know where these treatment facilities would be located. A lot of people don't wanna have a sewage treatment plant next to their home. So that needs to be identified. Um, 
the RENA numbers coming up may affect the build out in San Lorenzo Valley, although it is confined largely to within the urban services line, but that needs to be discussed with the public to assure them that it will not create massive um, build out in the San Lorenzo Valley. How will this affect the groundwater recharge in the San Lorenzo Valley? I would be curious to see a study of that stream flow and interconnection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address this on this item? Madam Clerk, anybody online? We do have speakers online, Chair, but if I may just make a brief announcement. Um, if you're sitting on the dais, please be aware that there are emergency buttons underneath the, um, the desk, and we've had an accidental press. So if you could please monitor those buttons and make sure that, that you're uh, not accidentally bumping those, that would be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, your microphone is now available. Thank you very much. This is Nancy Macy. I am chair of the Valley Women's Club's Environmental Committee for the San Lorenzo Valley and lived in Boulder Creek for almost 50 years. Uh, I'm a newcomer <laughs> compared to many of the other people. We are grateful to Supervisor McPherson's leadership in seeking solutions for this issue, uh, to uh, Dave Reed and his crew's incredible work, and to the board's attention to it. We have to acknowledge, however, the vital importance of healthy functioning septic systems. Those systems are the ideal wastewater treatment system for our mountains. They are vital to maintaining groundwater levels, especially during the ever increasing drought years that put demands on that resource. Second, however, the importance of properly functioning septic systems must also be acknowledged since a failing system can and does impact the health and well-being of our waterways, of neighboring residences, and so on. The three areas that would be served by this proposal are all in dire need. Maybe not as big as the map shows, but uh, the, the, the basic uh, areas. There are two caveats. First, the system has to be designed to survive being undermined by mudslides like has affected Bear Creek Road in 236 this year. The design of that original SLV sewer system failed to address that very idea. And a mudslide would have uh, allowed all the septic septage to fall into the river. So that's another reason for its failure, but that will be an important priority. And finally, the system must be designed to serve the existing businesses and residents safely and effectively without opening currently unbuildable parcels to development. We do believe this is a problem because of the strains on our current water supply and ongoing into the future of drought. The problems of traffic and its attendant pollution, the challenges of increasing population on our school system, the threat of wildfire, and having to evacuate the increase, uh, <clears throat> and all these problems, non-point source pollution. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We had no further speakers, Chair. All right, I'll bring it back to the board, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd uh, move the recommended action uh, to accept the report and direct staff to return in October uh, or sooner to give us a status update. A second. Motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Cummings. Roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Move on to item nine, which is a public hearing to consider the 2022 general plan annual report to accept and file two related annual reports and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO. We have the agenda item board memo, the general plan annual report, the housing successor annual uh, report. Mr. Carlson. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chair. Yes, David Carlson from the uh, Planning Division of CDI. I'll um, be presenting the report today. Um, so this presentation uh, will be on the three annual reports to the state, all related to the um, general plan and housing. Um, the general plan annual report describes activities related to implementation of the general plan. The housing element annual progress report includes various housing statistics and a report on implementation of programs in the housing element. And the housing successor agency annual report provides the status of the former redevelopment agency funds. 
Um, the general plan annual report provides information required by the county code in these four areas. Um, the sustainability update was approved by the board um, and the general plan amendments related to uh, backing up that that was the sustainability update was approved in uh, December of 2022 by the board. And general plan amendments related to the medical office building project are still pending. Uh, there were no changes to commercial agricultural land classifications, no development applications that triggered formal park site reviews. The capital improvement program was found consistent with the general plan, and there were no conflicts regarding coastal priority uses. Um, there were no requests to change the urban services line. And in 2023, the priority for the planning division is to complete the update of the housing element and continue work on updating the coastal hazards chapter of the. Um, Agreed. Safety yeah, element. No, I had I was not aware that that was going. To... Apologies for that disruption. That's fine, Mr. Carlson. Please, that, that came right in between two slides, so mm -hmm. no, no problem. Okay, the housing element annual report is a series of tables uh, containing housing statistics and the status of programs in the existing 2015 housing element. Um, table A and A2 contain uh, detailed data on housing development applications that were submitted to the planning division in 2022, discretionary housing development applications that were improved, that were approved or entitled, um, all ministerial building permit applications, um, and how and and permits issued um, and housing construction completed. Uh, these are large and detailed tables, um, and they're not re reproduced in this staff report, but they'll be submitted to the state. Um, however, Table D is a summary of uh, the key information, which is building permits issued for new housing units, which count towards the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RENA. Um, and Table D contains information on the implementation of all of the programs in the 2015 housing element. Uh, so table B um, in the housing element annual progress report places all the new housing units represented by issued building permits in 2022 into affordability categories. Column one in green is the county's RENA number in each income level or affordability category uh, for the planning period, which extends to 2023 through 2023. Um, the, the income levels are further categorized as non-deed restricted, which is generally the private sector housing market, um, and deed restricted, which mostly represents the nonprofit sector creating new housing units with um, financial assistance from county housing funds and, and other sources. Uh, but it also includes some density bonus units um, developed in the private sector. Uh, the county does not actually build any of this housing. Uh, the second column lists the issued building permit data for each year of the arena planning cycle. Um, in 2022, the highlight is permits that were issued for the construction of 115 units of deed restricted, very low income housing units, um, including 65 housing units um, affordable to households of extremely low income um, and 60 units of deed restricted, low income housing units. Column three totals the number of permits issued in each income category um, during the planning cycle and column four lists the total remaining RENA in each in income category. Um, and this, so this is a graphical summary of that table B data showing the trend, trend lines in each affordability category and the RENA target represented by the same color dots on the right um, and below a table showing the percentage progress towards the target in each category. Um, it's showing nearly meeting or exceeding the target number of new housing units in the low and moderate income categories in orange and gray. Um, and 59% progress toward meeting the RENA numbers in the very low income category in blue and 67% progress in meeting the moderate income category in yellow. Uh, many of the units in the non-deed restricted low and moderate income categories are represented by ADUs of various sizes. Um, and this overall upward trend over the years can be seen as a result of ADU streamlining legislation and county code updates since 2018. Uh, table D reports on implementation of all the programs in the 2015 housing element grouped into these six categories. 
um, every program has been implemented and, and to some extent, or, uh, and some of the highlights um, include the sustainability update, including new zoning tools for higher density residential and mixed use, the density bonus program, um, ADU deregulation, amendments to the public facility zone district to encourage affordable and uh, school employee rental housing, um, updated codes for farm worker housing, uh, financial assistance to numerous affordable housing projects, preserving the affordability of mobile home parks, um, uh, preserving affordable units in foreclosure, uh, loans to first time home buyers, short term rental security deposit assistance, um, and assistance in providing units for former foster youth and assistance to affordable housing projects for seniors. Um, and securing state funds for projects that include units for farm workers, extremely low income households, and persons with mental health issues. Um, and there are many more examples detailed in uh, Table D of the um, Housing Element Annual Progress Report. Um, the third annual report is on the fund where the assets of the former redevelopment agency were placed, um, and it is a continuing source of financial assistance to affordable housing projects, uh, more so in the past when the fund was larger. Uh, the fund undergoes an annual audit, um, and this is a summary of the status of the fund in fiscal year 2021-22. Uh, uh, the revenues are a result of loan repayments, uh, rents, and sale of property and interest on the fund. Um, and on, it, it should be noted that the maximum expenditure allowed from this fund on homeless services is $250,000, which um, has been consistently spent out of this fund over the years. And so the recommended actions are to conduct a public hearing on the 2022 general plan annual report, um, accept and file the report, and the fiscal year 2021-22 housing successor agency report. Um, and direct staff to submit these annual reports to the Governor's Office of Planning and Research and the California Department of Housing and Community Development. And that's the end of my report. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Carlson. Any questions from board members? Supervisor Cummings, please. Thank you for that presentation. I also just wanted to comment um, and thank the staff and on the production of the deed restricted affordable housing because for our very low and low housing, ensuring that those are in our affordable and perpetuity is what's really going to help us address our housing crisis. Um, I wanted to see if I heard something correctly with the ADUs, are those being applied to the moderate housing category or how are those being considered? Uh, what we do with ADUs is we look at existing data on market rate rents and various affordability categories based on some uh, state published formulas and then looking at the size of the ADUs compared to those the market, we place them in either the low or the moderate category. Generally, the studio and maybe some of the one bedroom ADUs are placed in the low income category and the larger ADUs in the moderate income category. And I'm just curious if, if you have any information on what the area mean income level needs to be to qualify for those different categories. I do have that data because that's what we use to do this work, but I don't have it at my fingertips, uh, but I, I could follow up with you and, and provide That'd be great. information to you. Yeah, it'd be great because it's just helpful for folks to understand what income level we're talking about when we say very low, low, moderate, because um, we're seeing market rate studios go for $3,000 a month. So right. really trying to understand what incomes we're, we're hitting is, is helpful. So, but thank you for the, for the presentation and uh, I'll follow up with you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez, did you have a question? <laughs> with um, some of the some of those funds, uh, are those funds that can be used for like uh, first time home buyers assistance and home repair programs and possibly like ADU type loans? I know not all banks do ADU loans, but can, can that those funds be used for any programs like that? Yes. In fact, um, some of the funds from the affordable housing impact fee um, that's charged on new development are going to be um, go towards an ADU incentive program that will be launched later this year to provide um, help to people that want to develop ADUs. 
um, and then fund additionally funds from that program and and the um, housing uh, low and moderate income housing asset fund um, go towards affordable housing programs, uh, including uh, rental assistance and first time home buyer assistance. I'll follow up and find out more about that too. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Carlson, for that report. Um, and the last time the board received this information regarding the percentage of households uh, built since 2014 under our prior prior arena allocations, um, the numbers did not look nearly as good. I think it was just over 50%, and now you're showing 79%, which is very encouraging. But um, that said, um, the new allocation that we have for county is uh, nearly three times what we had here. Uh, it's going to be a, a high cliff to get over, uh, and it, we're, I'm not just speaking for Santa Cruz County, but I can tell you when I attend uh, California State Association of Counties, CSAC, uh, they, they don't know how they're going to get there either, but um, we'll uh, hope we can work together so the county will be able to step up to the plate and um, do our part in a smooth transition to getting more housing and more permits issued. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think the report is actually better than expected at 79%. That's, that's pretty good. It's not where we need to be, but um, it's better than where we were. And 350% uh, increase in our arena numbers in the next cycle is definitely uh, an intimidating cliff, as Supervisor McPherson suggested. Um, so to that point, in terms of how we're going to meet it, I mean, the mention of the ADUs is good. It, that is certainly one avenue we could take to building more low income housing, but especially given that it's taking about, I think last time I checked, 190 days or something to permit an ADU today, there's definitely room for improvement there. And uh, if we do that, we should be able to get more affordable housing built that way. You had mentioned that some of the affordable housing that has been built is in dedicated projects and others is through um, you know, the, the requirements of uh, and density bonuses that are built in market rate projects. Do you have a sense of what the breakdown is? Far fewer under the density bonus program. Those are in the private development projects. So they're generally one, one or two units per project. And that, that's actually detailed in the growth control report that um, you know we produced uh, later last year. And you can see that um, some of the the subsidized affordable housing projects have a much higher, obviously much higher percentage of the deed restricted affordable units, including the ones that are going through the density bonus program, but the private development projects usually um, going to be, you know, one or two units per project or something like that. Sure. Yeah. I understand that the, in a private project, there's a less affordable housing units built. I'm just curious of all the affordable housing built is 20% of it in private developments. 50%, 10%, 10%, 10%, all park sense of that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have a sense for that um, unless right anybody here. else here might be able to. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So, uh, so the question is in terms of the affordable units that uh -huh. we've built, what percentage of them are being built in um, you know, dedicated projects for affordable housing, um, typically built by nonprofit okay. affordable housing developers and what percent are being built as so in the report a, okay so i think we have a couple large affordable sorry priscilla wilson with housing um i think in this report we had a couple projects that received density bonus one of them was a 100 affordable housing project the 1500 capitola road project and then we have a couple density um, bonus units um correct me if i'm wrong david in um market rate units. So those generally are much smaller. There's usually, if it's a for sale project, they come in with a 10% bonus. So they only provide 10% of the units. So it's usually one to two units that are affordable out of like a 25 unit project. I don't know if that answered your question. It's, it's not a substantial amount of the four market projects that are developing the affordable units. Uh, totally. I, I understand that. I'm curious if you add up all the smaller amounts, right. what percentage of the, all the low income housing that has been built do they account for? Um, if I could clarify, are you asking what percentage are being developed 
through private projects versus what is being developed through subsidized exactly project. Exactly. You can get a sense of that. You know, I I I'm, I can't do the math right now for you, but you yeah. can get a sense from that in Table B. So where it's broken down um, by either deed restricted or non deed restricted. So you, the the all of the units developed in the non deed restricted category, those are generally going to be um, projects developed by the private sector, and all the um, units deed restricted units in each in the low and very low and moderate categories are going to be the um, projects that are developed by generally nonprofit developers with public subsidies. Okay, thank you. I'll look at that. I mean, the reason I ask is ultimately, if we're trying to you know, increase the amount of affordable housing produced 350%, fully subsidized projects will only get us so far. And so and to some extent, we have to create conditions whereby the market can also produce a substantial number of these units. Exactly, one, which was one of the goals of the sustainability update to, right. to allow for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I'd like to open it up and also thank you for helping us the question. I'd like to welcome up to the community on this item. Morning, welcome, and thank you for waiting today. Uh, yes, my name is Charles Rolander. I just had a general question. We were talking about uh, septic systems uh, in the prior presentation. I'm just wondering, uh, with ADUs, do those can they be hooked up to an existing septic system, or do they have to be uh, hooked up to a sewer line, or how does that all work? Thank you. Do you have any other questions for us, or is that your primary question? That's my question. Thank you. Is there, before we address it, is there anybody else from the community here that would like to present any comments on this item? Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. Um, I think this county needs to increase the percentage of affordable housing units that we require under Measure J that developers do measure J set it at 15%. I think we need to follow the lead of our, uh, the city of Watsonville, for example, and increase that to 20% and hold them to it. The in lieu payment fees that this county did for a few years was a disaster. <laughs> And I think we should never go back there and we should increase it to 20% required. Can ADUs be uh, required to be deed restricted to be affordable? I have a lot of hesitation about classifying an ADU as affordable just because of the size. I hear that often used in developer applications that they are affordable by design. But as Supervisor Koenig, I think, said, studios small spaces are being rented out for $3,000 a month. That's not affordable. They're small, <laughs> but that's not affordable. So can ADUs be restricted to be uh, deed restricted to be affordable? I am aware of a few that ADUs that have been built and are actually rented out as ADUs, as um, um, Airbnbs. So they're not, uh, they, they should not always be counted in our arena numbers. How many applications has the county received for tiny homes on wheels, which is another um, avenue this board has taken to address um, housing? And um, I think this this county needs to look at partnerships with the la large agricultural uh, growers and companies to provide farm worker housing, which is now allowable, especially in light of the Pajaro Valley flooding. Um, they certainly need to be partners here, and um, I would like to see that. To to the end of the sixth cycle, Rena, there you. is. Thank you, Mr. Brenner. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address this? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? I see no speakers online, Chair. All right, Mr. Carlson, there was a question asked regarding the ADUs and septics. I understand the answer is depends, but if you want to go ahead and address it to the degree possible. Upon review of an application for an ADU, environmental health would look at the status of the existing septic system and based on the size of the ADU, either require um, uh, improvements to the assist 
well, either established that the existing system can handle the uh, additional bedroom or two or what what have you, um, or if the system would need to be expanded to accommodate the ADU. But it's very similar to simply adding a bedroom to your house and determining if the existing septic system can handle that or if it needs to be expanded. It, you're, you're not necessarily required to build a separate new septic system for a new ADU. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. All right, uh, seeing no one else, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I'll move the, uh, the general plan and staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. That passes unanimously. I, I recognize we've been going straight, but these next two items should be pretty quick. So if the board's okay with it, we'll just go straight through. Okay, we'll do item 10, which is a public hearing to consider proposed 2023-24 benefit assessment rates for county service area number three to request a submittal of ballots for the proposed 23-24 benefit assessments. Continue the public hearing to May 9th, 2023 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO Director of Community Development and Infrastructure of the Agenda item board memo. And welcome back, Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair and Supervisors. Um, I'll be brief on this one. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so that in before you is a public hearing for benefit assessment rate increase for CSA 3. Uh, CSA representatives have requested the Board of Supervisors to adopt a resolution of intention to authorize and levy an increased assessment uh, for Aptos Seascape Road Median Maintenance, Street Utility Facilities, Beach Access Maintenance, uh, Patrol and Litter Control Services for the beach area below the Via Palo Alto and extending south to the resort. In order to complete this process, uh, it will be necessary for the board to open the public hearing, take testimonies and consider objections or protests to the proposed benefit assessments, and then close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and continue the public hearing to May, to May 9th, 2023 to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballot proceedings. Uh, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have about the process or the project. Any questions before I open up the public hearing? Okay, seeing none, we will open up the public hearing officially. Is there anybody here from the community that would like to address us? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I am not a resident within the boundaries of CS3, A3, but I have friends who are, and there is a lot of concern about the um, unfairness of this procedure. Um, a special benefit assessment procedure is supposed to um, show the calculation of the benefit that each parcel will get and um, that it is proportional to the benefit that each parcel property owner gets. That has not been done in this engineer's report. It is a blanket assessment uh, for different for the properties um, and does not identify the the proportional special benefit to any of the parcels. I did go to the public uh, meeting that was held at the Seascape um, Resort. And what was clear to me and many of the people there was that people who live along the beach and at the beach access will receive a much greater benefit from the cost of this increase that covers the beach cleanups and trash removal at the beach uh, access than will those who are not even near the beach. But those who are not near the beach are being charged the same. There were many protests at that, uh, that community meeting. And I'm sorry that, you know, maybe there were people here earlier that wanted to speak to that. But it is not, the engineer's report was not detailed and did not separate special benefit from general benefit, which is required under the constitutional article 13 C and D. So um, I, I will be curious to see how this goes. And um, thank you for giving the public a chance to speak about it. Is there anybody else here for this item during the public hearing? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online for the public hearing? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, I will close the public 
comment portion of the public hearing. Now we'll bring it back to the board for action. Remember the recommended actions were to open the public hearing, hear any objections or protests, to request the submittal of all ballots for the benefit assessment for CSA number three to close the public comment and to continue the public hearing to May 9th to offer tabulation and certification. Is there a recommend? Is there a motion for the recommended actions? So moved. I'll second. We have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. That passes unanimously. The last item on today's uh, open session is item 11, which is a public hearing to consider proposed 2023-24 benefit assessment rates for county service area number 51 to request the submittal of ballots for the proposed 23-24 benefit assessments and continue the public hearing to May 9th, 2023 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO, Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair and Supervisors. Again, Matt Machado, Deputy CAO, Director CDI. Uh, the item before you is a public hearing for benefit assessment rate increases for CSA 51. CSA representatives have requested the Board of Supervisors to adopt a resolution of intention to authorize and levy an increased assessment for road landscaping, road maintenance, and road improvements within CSA number 51, Hopkins Gulch. In order to complete this process, it will be necessary for the Board to open the public hearing, take testimonies, and consider objections or protests to the proposed benefit assessments, and then to close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and continue the public hearing to May 9th to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballot proceedings. And I can answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions of Mr. Machado before we open up the public hearing? Okay, seeing none, I'll officially open up the public hearing for this item. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the public hearing for benefit assessment rate increases for CSA 51? Welcome back, sir, and thank you again for waiting. No problem. I'll bet you guys are ready for some lunch. Can we restart the time for him, Madam Clerk, just because he hasn't started yet? Okay, well, I'm one of the uh, 23 CSA 51 um, people with a ballot due today. And uh, CSA 51 has some problems. This is a third special assessment that we've had within the last five years. And each one is progressively larger by 100, 200% or something. And uh, this one needs to be paid uh, in taxes during the next two years, which means in my case, $4,000 to 4,200 or something to be paid uh, in uh, the next tax payment, which is already paid for my my recent one, but anyway, in November, uh, there's another one due. And then also in uh, April, the second, and this is due in two installments. So that makes me come up with about $8,500 uh, in the next extra after I'm already paying almost that, almost that much in taxes anyway. Um, so uh, I don't think that this whole thing has been handled real well because um, FEMA got involved and this whole thing started in 1917 and each one of these assessments has been kind of tied on to uh, that first one with each one getting larger. <clears throat> anyway, um, my decision uh, is reluctant to vote yes, but I would rather request a new ballot. And I know time's limited because FEMA is involved. And uh, so I already voted yes on this. I don't know how the rest, I know there's a lot of discontent among the members. I, I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. But um, I think that uh, Hopkins Gulch Road is the lifeline to those parcels. And without that road, you know, the property is not worth much and the houses are probably not worth much. So anyway, the problems uh, I see based on uh, my experience, and uh, I've been, I'm retired now, but I've been a California licensed real estate broker. I have a master's degree in business, and I used to teach accounting uh, as an adjunct professor at Cabrillo College, so I have quite a bit of background. <clears throat> the problems that I see today um, is the tax history, this particular uh, a uh, road association was formed in uh, uh, 
1978, which is probably a familiar year to you guys, because that's when Prop 13 passed. And uh, since then, there's also been uh, Prop 218, which also passed after this uh, road association was formed. And sir, if you could just finish up your comments, please. Okay. Well, I sent uh, I sent a uh, an email to all of you board members, and uh, this involves uh, Santa Cruz LAFTA to uh, LAFCO, and I know Justin and friend are also on that commission. And uh, I'm probably, I, I spent out 40 hours researching all this. I'm pretty familiar with it. And uh, I haven't checked into any of the other road associations and road associations are very different from some of the other CSAs. And to me, they should be based on uh, the road itself, not to a bunch of parcels that are grouped together, originally based on value. And uh, to me, uh, I don't know whether that's being, this is because this is really old or whether uh, whether new, uh, new CSA road associations are being uh, treated in the same way or not. But to me, the road association should define the length of the road, which uh, ours is not very well defined at all. I looked at LAF, LAFCO records, the last left, LEFCO review was in November of 1922, not, not very long ago. So I'm sure a couple of you were on that. And I know there are some other individuals from the county and cities that are on that, on that commission. So um, it says the road is 4.7 miles in length. It's a one lay road. I assume it's a public road now. I think it had to become a public road when uh, left uh, uh, agreed to have it as a CSA. Um, and anyway, I, I'd like to know what the length of the road is. This is not spelled out anywhere. I've asked the county earlier for that and I get no answer because it's not very well defined at all. Okay. But anyway, for regular maintenance of the road, to me, it should be divided into equal lengths for maintenance of the road. And uh, for special assessments, um, it can be those same distances could be used if it provides access through driveways and private roads that come off of Cop uh, Hopkins, Gul Hopkins Gulch Road. Okay, sir. Right I, now, it's not that, so. I appreciate it. And, okay. and I think, and Mr. Machado, you may want to oh. spend some answer, well, not now, but answer some questions with them afterwards. Is there anybody else from the community that would like to address this in this chambers during this public hearing? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? We have no speakers online, Chair. And I just wanted to ensure that he had a full opportunity because he was the only speaker here for the public hearing. It's important to make sure that that was afforded. Thank you, sir, for waiting so long. We'll bring it back to the board for action on this item. Is there a motion for the recommended actions? So moved. Second. All right, a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. We'll get a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously and also ends our regular uh, session. Council, is there anything reportable out of closed session? Not today. All right, so we'll go straight into closed session.